November 1st, 2024. I have a, one special announcement. We all wish Dr. Darby a happy birthday. There will be no singing. There's no place I would rather be. <laughs> oh, hey, I've been here on my anniversary. So. Yeah, I think all of us have done that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I'll go over to the order. I hope you're not planning on changing anything now. I think it's the uh, order of the agenda. So, um, but before I call um, for a public comment, I'd like to just uh, make a statement. Um, so, board members, Dr. Darty, staff, teachers, guests, community members. This evening, our school committee and administration have a considerable agenda to accomplish to lead and manage our district toward our mission of inspiring the innovative leaders of tomorrow. But as I was preparing today, I was filled with angst as we released yet another letter related to caustic and hateful graffiti. I'm frustrated. At times I'm angry, but mostly my heart is heavy and somber. These acts of vandalism, anti-Semitism, racism, and bigoted, hateful speech, these continued actions are deeply impactful and hurtful to the people that they target. They impact all of our students and all of us. Our community starts to question if our schools will be welcoming and safe for their children. Should they stay in Reading or should they begin to look elsewhere? Earlier this week, I heard a longtime Reading resident and graduate of RMHS, now a parent of an elementary student, tearfully question if this town that she loves is truly a safe place for her child. My own children are grown. And it was a very powerful message for me to listen to her. It is my most firm belief that these words and acts are truly not who we all are. We must show ourselves and our community that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. I found this quote on Tuesday evening. We will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. What I say now, to our parents, our students, our teachers, our staff, and the greater community, what I say is friends, it is our responsibility, each of us, to take action to stop this. Help us identify the individuals who continue these acts of hate. I am not sure if I am ready to show compassion. I know they will need compassion. But we must bring this to an end, and we must refocus on our mission for all of our students and all of us. I ask that you talk to your children, your young adults, and with our schools, teach them, help them to learn to embrace the subtle and the vast differences between each of us. When these differences, this diversity, is respected and valued, they make us a stronger, more creative and vibrant community. We must not be divided by this hate. We must be truly unified and draw power to ourselves from that unification. Truly unified in respect, empathy, kindness, and love for each other. I appreciate deeply all of the people in this room who are working so hard. 
and I would especially acknowledge the folks in the front row tonight. Our police, police force, our police officers, our town manager, our superintendent, our staff, Principal Boynton. It's been, it's very challenging. So let's, let's step together and we all have an opportunity to show that unification and respect and our spirit of hope on Saturday night at 6 p.m. here outside RMHS. So I invite everyone to participate. Um, I would also, just at this point in time, invite my fellow committee members if they would like to um, make a brief statement and then we'll move into public input. So thank you. Ms. Sprowski. Um, I don't have much to add to that. That was perfect. Thank you for speaking for all of us. Um, the only thing I will add, and I'm sure we're going to be hearing more about it tonight, is that as I've thought about these repeated incidents, it does seem like we have two obligations. One is to sort of find out who is doing this and deal with that, which is a very difficult and challenging problem, but we have to do that. But the other is how do you support groups of students and staff and community members who are feeling targeted and who are feeling unsafe. I mean, like that's been a very helpful way for me to frame it. We need to do both. It isn't one or the other. We have to do both, so I'm interested in doing that. Much. Thank you. Dr. Doctor. Um, thank you. You both said it so well. Um, the anti-Semitic and hate symbols and words that have been written in public spaces in our town and in our schools are very disturbing, um, beyond disturbing. And although the intent is unknown, the impact is clear. The hate they represent, like you said, has no place in our community, in a loving community such as Reading. People have asked and suggested that this hate is just some kids scribbling on the walls or looking for attention and therefore we should just ignore it. Dr. Ornstein has talked to us about what happens when you ignore these hateful signs. They are portent, portents of what is to come. As she quotes Timothy Snyder, if you ignore these symbols today, then they become the reality of tomorrow. And we are already seeing the impact of this, the killing at Pittsburgh, the attack on the predominantly African-American First Baptist Church in Jefferson Town, Kentucky. They all follow the Anti-Defamation League's pyramid of hate. First there's talk, the jokes, the stereotyping, that escalates to outward symbols, graffiti, and public displays, and it grows on social media. And then comes the violence. Well, the violence is here. Reading is obviously not immune to this trajectory and I'm extremely proud of our schools and recently our local government for what they are doing to educate and empower our students, families and residents to face and respond to this hate. Many thanks to our superintendent, school staff and so many others for your leadership. Ellie Wiesel used to write about the eyes at the window when he and six million other Jews, actually more than nine million people, including those marginalized by society, and those are sometimes considered low estimates, were led off to the concentration camps. Most of their neighbors and friends parted their curtains and watched. They did nothing. They felt powerless. They weren't necessarily malicious, but they felt powerless or had come to believe the lies that were told about the targets of the hate. We need to ensure in our community, in our nation, that there are no more eyes at the window, that there are upstanders everywhere who will not allow people to be targeted and marginalized, doubted or hurt. Pittsburgh is no different than Reading or Winchester or Marblehead where I grew up. I arrived at my temple's Hebrew school on Sunday to a police car and a policeman with a gun. And there were kids walking around them to go to the Hebrew school classes. This is not the way it should be, and it's up to us to stop it. Thank you to everyone who came to the rally against hate and anti-Semitism on October 21st at Reading Common. RCTV is working on and, um, getting that video out there. There are many opportunities this weekend to add your voice to this rejection of hate and violence, including and most importantly, the candlelight vigil at RMHS on Saturday night at 6. Please open your eyes and move your feet and don't be the eyes at the window. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Johnson. So, uh, I, I 
would just like to, to thank Ms. Webb for that very uh, thoughtful uh, statement. Uh, I would also like to add that uh, I had a chance to uh, watch the, not live, but the YouTube uh, of the Board of Selectmen's meeting uh, the other night. And, and one thing that broke my heart was uh, listening to a parent uh, talk about her LGBTQ uh, uh, student or steward son. Uh, and I think that, you know, what, what the selectmen are doing, what the police are doing, what the superintendent doing are, we hear her and we're doing something about that. And I really, uh, I know the amount of time and, and thoughtful time that you're putting into this. And I, you know, I appreciate that and I'm confident with that. Uh, so thank you. Ms. Bond. Yes. Can I want to restate everything that everyone said so far and thank Ms. Webb for that statement. It was, it was very well done. I agree with everything everyone said. The one thing that I would add to Mr. Robinson's comments is um, it's all of our job to do something. It's, it's every one of us in Reading. It's our job. It's, it's not the select board only. It's not the school committee only. It's not our, um, you know, our, our public servants. It's up to us. We are the public. Everybody who lives in Reading, everybody who interacts in Reading, it's our job to, to be proactive and not just reactive. It's appropriate to react. I, I'm glad to see the outpouring of, of focus on, on uh, anti-hate speech, anti-hate acts. Um, but it's every one of us needs to get, as I'm thinking here, I'm thinking to myself, what can I tell my kids when I go home and talk to them tomorrow? Um, how can I be more proactive? Um, and, and I'll admit to at first kind of thinking, I'm, I'm not sure what I can do, I'm just one person. Um, I do have a seat at this table and, and I'm using it in, the, in this moment, but there's more, there's more that I need to do and we need to keep thinking, what else can we do? And we need to not stop, right, and not get discouraged. Um, it, it's something that, even if these incidents were to stop, we don't stop with a positive message of inclusion uh, and caring and, and, and empathy for, for everyone in our community. And it makes us better human beings. So I just want everybody to think about what they can do tomorrow to address the needs and, and the issues that have been raised here. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Thanks. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to I want to echo a couple of things that, that have been said. I, I want to thank the um, town manager for being here and our police department for being here. Uh, our two school resource officers and um, Lieutenant Abadi for for all the work that they've done. Uh, this is truly a collaborative effort in trying to figure out what is going on. I also want to commend the work that Kate Boynton is doing on this. Her first year as principal um, and she has done an amazing job not only she's been doing an amazing job in general but dealing with with these with these issues. Um, I mean, we've had five issues of graffiti over since October 12th. Two SWAT stickers on October 12th, a SWAT sticker on October 27th impacting our Jewish community. October 29th, we had threatening graffiti that impacted our LGBTQ community. And then the last two days, October 31st, November 1st, we had threatening graffiti that impacted our students of color. And I have to tell you, and I'm, I think I'm speaking for the educators in the room, the police, town manager, um, we're upset, we're angry, we're frustrated, we're distraught at what right now. Um, this is not what we should be doing. We should be working with students. We should be building a better community. Um, the events, they're troubling. I don't, they don't define who we are as a community. Um, but right now, it's, it's what we have to do to, to do to get our community out of this and moving forward. I want to echo also that there are people outside this room that have been doing an amazing job. Our teachers, our administrators, um, this past week alone, we've had challenge day in our middle schools in eighth grade. 
And it's interesting because the theme of Challenge Day, it all is about diversity and respect and overcoming obstacles and how you work with each other. Um, Ms. Boynton has sent several letters out over the last two weeks that have talked about all of the activities that are going on. Um, the vigil is one, courageous conversations next week. And I know there's more to come. She's uh, going to be forming a diversity committee at the high school um, with staff and students that are going to be continuing to look at this. I want to I want to echo what the town manager said in the joint press release yesterday that these acts of hate just need to stop. And as some of you have already said, we're in time of great unrest in this country. <coughs> Different groups are being targeted as we've seen even here in Reading. Um, all of us, including parents, administrators, staff, students, and the greater Reading community need to come together and recognize these acts of hate are real and they need to be addressed by all of us working together. And as your superintendent, I'm gonna to continue to work diligently and collaboratively until this stops. Um, we need to strengthen our culture of inclusiveness. We have to remove divisiveness. And we need to create a safe and supportive community for our staff and students. So we will continue to investigate. We will continue to see what else we can do. We have been receiving a lot of feedback from um, the community, uh, which we appreciate. I've met with several parents, talked to several parents, assured them that this is a very safe school district, um, and that we are going to continue to do everything we can. So thank you. Um, Mr. Lalashore, or um, the technical body, any of it? I just wanted to give you the opportunity if there was something you wanted to add. Not compulsory, though. Just uh, one word. So. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Students in this building need to recognize this. I'm not sure if that was captured on every mic, but I just want to emphasize that our town manager, Bob LaLaShore, just really said the key thing that needs to happen here is that this needs to stop and that students that may know what's going on in this building really need to collaborate and work with the police. Um, so we're really um, looking for that, and I think that... Um, just to maybe close that out, that certainly speaks to our friends not being silent. It's past that time. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. No one on the board knew we were really going to do this <laughs> and address this. So I appreciate the fact that this was maybe a little bit of a impromptu part of our meeting here. So thank you. Um, I would like to offer uh, public comment for any items that are not on the agenda tonight. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Please come up to the mic. Oh, Becky, right over there. At the podium. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I never expected to be here in uh, this capacity after more things had happened. I had originally planned to come to this meeting to thank the members of the school committee for their support and um, their presence at the rally on October 21st, as well as the town manager, Dr. Doherty. Um, we really appreciated your support. Um, and I wanted to see, as far as uh, the issue that uh, Mr. Boyvin brought up about do something, I wanted to brainstorm for a minute with you about how to increase um, the visibility of this issue with the entire community of Reading and not just school parents. Uh, and if there's anything we can do to get the word out uh, more widely, I'm thinking, what if you're not on social media? What if you're an older resident who doesn't have a computer, like my mother? Uh, just uh, ways to involve so that Saturday night's vigil is an all-community event as opposed to a school event. Any ideas that you have? Um, I did see a flyer. I'm going to... Uh, on my day off, I'm going to put them up wherever I can think of. But if you have any thoughts, if you could blast it out to 
your email lists, anything you can do because the number of people who show up, it makes a huge difference. And, uh, and I thank you for holding it and for any uh, promotion you can do, that would be great if you could, um, I don't know, that billboard in the center of town. I don't know if a phone blast is ever a possibility. And the other um, question, I know this is on the minds of a lot of people. I'm a Jewish resident and a RMHS parent. And um, what's happening with, uh, with the investigation? Is it possible to get an update? And then what I had really wanted to talk about was um, also to ask about the progress on the teacher contract. I don't know if that's part of today tonight um so um mrs lieberman i i not if the if the police do want to address that question they can tonight they may not be able to but as far as the contract we cannot disclose we are still oh i just wondered if you know it's making me progress mediation uh, is scheduled for next week oh fantastic so. that's all i know that you can't mm -hmm. disclose what's going on in negotiations but so um any ideas that you have any help that you can provide um to make the vigil a success would be greatly appreciated thank you thank you all right there's no other public comment then we'll move on to the consent agenda um, is there anyone do we need anything removed from the consent agenda so I would like the um, minutes from 1018 removed please okay and So if we remove those minutes, um, so what would you like to just let the committee know? Sure. So um, my my question was about the liaison reports. Um, I know that um, Chair Webb had talked about the HRAC discussion and endorsement of question three and that they had recommended to the select board that they ha would address that that wasn't in there and that you had spoken about the importance of the transgender rights at, and how they are protected in the school. And so I felt that the record should show that the transgender rights are protected in the school by the school law separate than the um, then question three and then I had also spoken um, about the importance of um, transgender rights and how they cross the boundary of the schools and how students are impacted by their vulnerability which stems from wondering who's going to protect them and who's okay. not so you felt like it the, right now the minutes didn't capture the dialogue that was at the meeting yes okay so we'll remove the um, October 18th minutes from the consent agenda um, and we'll we'll take them out and we'll address how they'll be rewritten then um, or updated so we'll approve the consent agenda then without the, we need the motion to pursue, uh, approve it without the October 18th minutes. Thank you. All those in favor? Okay. So we'll address that with uh, Mrs. Engelson. And have put them into the next meeting. Let's wait. Um, reports our students are not here this evening so John Dr. Darty and the staff so I, so I would, Kelly. hi good evening uh, I just have a couple of announcements um, as part of my report uh, as most of you realize next Tuesday November 6th is a new school professional development day for the Reading schools um, a lot of times parents ask why do we not have school every election day uh, every some school districts think about it in the presidential election calendar um, we do so because we take advantage of shared commitment to professional development on that day so we have actually 15 different sessions going on within the district and externally including a large amount of people going to the Northeast Professional Education 
education network. The NBEN Association is all um, districts nearby that are sharing resources for that day. And in particular, we're looking at professional development in what sometimes is hard to fill. So positions like BCBAs, we have two for the district. It would be hard to have a speaker come in or professional development tailored to their needs. So the NPEN allows us to send, um, this year we're sending art, music, library, media, some of the PE teachers, business teachers, tech specialists, psychologists, world language, ELL teachers, BCBAs, speech language, some of our special education teachers that are, are specific to some programming. So we're really excited about that. In addition, uh, as I said, we're offering 14 other variations. Um, some of our teachers are going to UMass Lowell for a conference, but most of our, our staff is staying in-house. Uh, we're really excited about some of the PD work that is taking us at the high school with landmark, landmark outreach uh, that Kate Boynton and the department chairs are hosting uh, some work around some of the work with Landmark. We also have some learning communities by subject happening at the middle school. Uh, so we're really excited. It's been a lot of um, exciting times really thinking about the possibilities of that day. So we appreciate the fact that that is one of our professional development days and because it is on the election day, we can really uh, capitalize on that. In addition, November 16th, as you know, is a conference day throughout the district and November tends to be a little heavy with those kind of days. Um, as you know, elementary staff and high school staff will be involved in uh, conferencing. Um, however, we also have seven sessions of PD planned for paras for that day. Uh, our paras who will remain on site had options and they could pick different professional development uh, trainings. And we also have our middle school staff which do uh, their collaborative conferencing uh, with the students. They are gonna be doing a full day with subject area learning committees as well as data teamwork. They're gonna be looking at their advisories and they are also having landmark outreach come out for a small uh, workshop that day. So we're really excited about the November of PD, November tends to be a heavy PD uh, month for us here in Reading. Uh, in addition, uh, we have reformed the Late Start Committee. Um, prior to my tenure, there had been a committee several years ago. Um, some of you may remember that the Middlesex League has made a commitment, the 12 districts have made a commitment to look at Late Start for high school. Uh, as we know that the research is very clear that our kids are not getting enough sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, just recently, the American Medical Association came out with a stronger message about uh, morning and sleep times with high schoolers and really said that schools should not be starting before 8.30 uh, in the morning. So our committee um, is reformed. We invited everyone who sat on it the last time. Mrs. Webb is the school committee person. Um, Linda Williams, who is here tonight, and Kate Boynton, who is here tonight, are co-chairing with me. Um, and since we know we are changing uh, the times for high school, our plan is to recommend that to the school committee. That is our plan. Um, our committee is looking at how to make this a seamless a transition as possible. Towards that end, um, we have three subcommittees that are currently working on surveying staff, students, and families, asking them concerns or questions that they may have. We're also going to be creating a survey to send to the districts. There are currently six of them um, in the district in the Middlesex League that have already moved to Late Start and asking them what so certain um, obstacles or things that they hadn't thought of that they're concerned about. And we're also going to be creating a resources on Late Start and the research around that. So as we start making our recommendation and of course, you know, bringing it to you all, have a database so that parents and community members can access some of the materials that we've been looking at. Mm -hmm. So we are meeting throughout the month of November and I will be back here on December 6th uh, talking with some of the members of the team on our recommendation. Thank you. Mrs. Dowd? Thank you. Included in the packet that you have, I believe it is right after the agenda, is a revised fiscal 2020 budget calendar. The revisions reflect the discussion we had at the last meeting, and mainly it was to consolidate the regular day and special education budget presentations, which will now both occur on January 7th. What that will allow is for the public hearing on January 17th, we'll solely be public hearing and all presentations will be completed 
prior to that. So that was the only change that was made based upon the discussions that we had. Thank you. In addition, we did want to just bring one item up as a reminder um, that came out of the financial form in October that will be brought forth as part of the November town meeting. For those who were able to attend, FinCom requested to add $200,000 to the capital plan for the current year related to the Turf 2 project. And this came out of the, as many of you have heard us talk about here, the rapidly deteriorating condition, if I could say that mm -hmm. in one sentence, of the fields. Um, as you know, we have had to shut the fields down a couple of occasions this year in order to do repairs, and we've continued to do repairs throughout the current season. At this time, no decision on when to fund a replacement project has been made, nor whether that project will include lighting on any of the other four Birch Meadow fields. Such decisions will be discussed as part of the FY20 budget process, which will start for the town in December and in the schools in January. We are working very closely with the town manager to schedule dates at which all of the appropriate people can participate in the meetings throughout the December-January budget process. The $200,000 is meant to prepare for an April 2019 town meeting funding decision and potentially summer fall 2019 work if the gym is made to move forward with it. So we just wanted to bring that forth after town meeting once the final capital plan has been voted on we would bring it back for final vote from school committee but this is just to keep the committee aware. And the only other item which I did not mention at the last meeting is that the annual DESI end of year report that we file was completed and filed on October 1st, which was the deadline. So we were very happy to report that I think it's the first time mm -hmm. for the district that we have not had to request an extension. So it was filed, which is for me probably a good six to eight weeks earlier than it has been filed in the past. So right. significant accomplishment. Thank you too. Yep. The new hire that we yeah, added we have over the summer, we were able Thank to you. expedite that process. Right. Okay. Um, Dr. Starty. I do not have any other reports tonight. Okay. Just um, to piggyback, uh, Gail was just talking about town meeting, which, by the way, is begins Thursday, November 15th, Monday, November 19th, Monday the 26th, and Monday, Thursday the 29th. So just those are dates to make sure they're on your calendar. Do we do we have a feel for how many nights or what night you're going to speak? Or will that be the first? The 15th. Ideally, hopefully it'll be one, 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 one and done. <laughs> Good, because my birthday is one of those nights. <laughs> okay. um, all right. Uh, oh, sorry. Reports. Uh, Mr. Bobbin, do you have any reports? Nothing at this time. Mr. Robbins. Uh, no, the uh, Recreation Committee did not meet last month, but we're meeting next Wednesday night. So uh, that's an important meeting, actually, to discuss the Birch Meadow mm -hmm. and the softball. Sturgis Park. Yeah, Sturgis Park updates. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dotson. Um, Rikasa, I wasn't able to go to the meeting, but I hear tell Dr. Doherty was there and they're working on their bylaws. So, um, and then the other thing I just wanted to give a specific, specific shout out to um, the student Tali who spoke at the rally on October 21st. What a magnificent and powerful job she did straight from the heart. And she's been a really brave soul for a long time now. Um, and so I wanted to give a shout out to both her and the teachers and the administration who have been supporting her and other students through everything that's going on. So thank you. Ms. Sprowski. Really quick one. Writing 375 is having trivia night one week from tomorrow, November 9th, RCT stu RCTV Studios on Main Street at 7 o'clock. It's a really fun time. If you have not gone to one of the previous ones, can't recommend it more. I'll ditto that. Um, okay, I hadn't thought about my reports because I was so busy. Uh, so the report, uh, I did attend the end of the A-Track meeting and um, oh, we're, we're working, sorry, working on planning the Martin Luther King Day event which will be here at the uh, high school. So there's a lot of uh, activity on that. And also A-Track, um, 
was in front of the Board of Selectmen uh, Tuesday night to ask about um, support for question three, yes on question three, and that was uh, unanimously supported by the Selectmen and uh, the A-Track Committee and the members and, and all of the community members were ex I pr probably like elated would be a uh, not an overestimate but I think um, people were uh, a little bit surprised and very happy and so that's that was excellent um, I think that's it for report um, okay so we go into old business which is the second reading of the uh, food service policy and then after that we'll begin new business with the designer selection So we have left, I believe, on Sorry, on everybody's packet, I believe you yeah. have a black line version of the document. We did receive um, a couple of edits late in the day, so we weren't able to get it in the packet. They were um, minimal. It was more, we moved a couple of paragraphs around a couple of um, sentences to help them read better so no major substantive changes it was more cosmetic in nature we also did receive a question um, from a community member after the first reading asking us whether or not we should have a deadline for graduating seniors and um, if we did not receive indication from them how to treat the balance, we would consider a, do a donation. We actually are not allowed to do that. That is not allowable under law for us to automatically move the funds. It would have to go through the achievement process through the state, which is why we do not indicate that in there. We actually do not have a significant balance, and the majority of people do donate it, but we actually are legally not allowed to take any residual balances and turn it into a donation. So hopefully that addresses the question that we received. Mrs. Dodd, you did say most people do end up most people do end up donating. When they get through the to third or fourth kid, whatever yes. they roll the balances, the fifth or final one is a donation. Mm -hmm. But some of them sit there and people call years later and <laughs> we do refunds or move them to whoever they tell us to or yeah. make the donation then. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, we'll finally like, Pippi gets a balance. <laughs> to follow up on that point, I mean, the, the policy says that they can't participate in graduation if they have a non-zero, which I assume means positive balance. So are these people that then did not attend graduation? If they have a negative it, balance. It, it says non-zero. No, it says, it says if they owe $20. I'm going to have to check it to say where is that. We could clarify says that. The that public schools must work. a zero balance to participate in graduation activities. Oh. We can clarify that's if they have a negative zero balance, balance they're, they're not less. able to, yeah. is okay. the intent and of that. It says students who has a positive balance may transfer the balance, but it's... it's it says it's must have a zero balance to participate in graduation activities. Yeah. We can, we right. can so, clarify that I mean, if it's that less than clearly zero. make people do something quickly about that <laughs> extra donation. <laughs> like, okay, I'm going to donate so I can walk. So, that, that's what it... Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so can uh, Ms. Doc Dox, you want to read the motion? Let's get the motion on the table and you do. But there you go. Thank you. Move to accept the second reading and approval of revised policy EFDA unpaid meal charges. Second. Second. Okay, so I think other than that sort of minor change. Are there any other questions from the committee? I hate to be a stickler here, but I'd feel more comfortable if we had a packet with the final version in it. I have nothing against what's written here or the what I perceive as friendly amendments that we've heard tonight. For the sake of the public record, I would abstain on this. So we can proceed the way you think best, but well, until I have the final, I won't vote for it until I see the final version in writing. Printable. Uh, the C, can we, can we, could we get it printed in the time that we address any other topics tonight, or not? No. No. You have to have it in the packet before you get it. Oh. 
we can okay, make is, the adjustments. This is sort of why I meeting. wasn't going to incorporate that feedback because it was very late. So just that people recognize we, you know, we need to give the feedback uh, in a timely manner. Um, Ms. Morello was not in the district today. It was a little bit difficult to do that. I think um, the input was incorporated, but you may still be able to act with yeah. an extension. Dr. Darty. So if, when you look at the policy, there are no changes to the policy. A paragraph was just moved. No, I, I, I appreciate that, that I said that these are friendly in nature, but what I have in front of me for the public record it is draft. it says draft and void. And I hear that there were changes that aren't reflected here. I just want the full, complete policy to be what I vote on. I think on. it would still think say draft. So, okay. But I can't wait, wait for something. You, do they? What do we I have? don't think you received the copy. It's right here. That may be part of the problem. Okay. I was wondering why I was getting the strange look. We're all sort of. All right. So, so now I, I have a red line. Back. Yes. Is, is this the policy that, that I'm holding? That is the policy yes. you are holding. Yes. And, and I apologize to Linda who did. Can we now? Now, what we me? could do because this is a school committee policy is yeah. we could just amend this by hand, make that part of the public record, and then I'm willing to vote on it. The amendment that we just said about the non-zero. Yeah, if we can write that in, just do a friendly amendment. I'm on board. That's on page two. Graduating Thank students you. who students who are graduating at the end of the year must have a zero balance to participate in graduation activities. Uh, I, I don't know how this all works, but it sounds like we want to add positive or zero balance. Where's the zero? I, I don't know what you want to. Students negative. must not have a negative, negative. balance. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. So students who are graduating at the end of the year must not have a negative balance to participate in graduation activities. Is that a negative balance uh, greater than a certain amount, were you saying, or just a negative balance? Just a negative balance. Okay. Must not have a negative, so we are adding between must and have, the word not, must not have a cross out zero and add negative balance to participate in graduation activities. So, so, uh, yeah. so moved? So moved. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Borowski, second. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. All in favor of that? Change? <laughs> there we go. Excellent. Amendment is done. Now we got to vote the policy. Yes. Now we have the policy. In now this is our policy. Board. Any other changes? I, Speak I, now. I do apologize. I'm about I, to vote on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Mr. Bob, would you like to second the motion? I will second, second the motion. <laughs> okay. And all those in favor? <laughs> all right. That's so moved. Zero. Excellent. Kristen, are you excited? You have a new policy. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. Kids. So for the next agenda item, I do believe the information is in the packet. <laughs> I hope so because I do not have copies. So I do want to invite up and I do want to thank um, Matt and Allison. So we the administrative services director, hopefully going to get correct. this correct. And on Budsman. And um, I can't. And um, yeah. and we also have the yeah. procurement <laughs> officer, Allison Jenkins, here. Um, part of the discussions we've been having all along throughout the school committee meetings, as well as at financial forum, is to ensure that the school department is working hand in hand with the town as we embark on some of these relatively significant capital projects um, that we've been discussing. It be the town and school safety, the enrollment studies, um, and as applicable, some of the, the turf work that we're embarking on. We've been working very closely with the town to ensure we have all of our processes and procedures in place. Um, and one of, I know, the main areas that, if I misspeak, let me know, Allison and Matt have been working on is to make sure that all of us are working collaboratively and ensuring we are following all of the mass general laws. So I will actually let um, Allison and Matt much more eloquently walk through the documentation that you have in there and then we can move forward with um, the acceptance of the procedures. So one of the one of the laws is the designer selection law. Oh, get the microphone. And we, you're required to um, to accept the uh, to draft and accept some designer selection procedures. Um, the town has accepted it through the town manager. You, uh, the school committee, need to do that as well, and the RMLD will need to do that as well. So we have before you the model procedures that are recommended um, by the inspector general's office. 
Um, so they're pretty boilerplate. I am going to have Allison walk you through some of the specifics just so you know before you vote. But just so you know what they are, we, we took them mostly from state law and from the IG's office. And um, they're pretty, pretty straightforward. We made one or two changes. By law, uh, you're the body that has to accept it. And um, so that's why we're here tonight, and we hope you do. So I'm going uh, to turn it over to Allison to give you a little bit more specifics. Thank you. And here's your microphone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me this evening. So um, Matt is correct that the majority of this procedure um, that you would be accepting is straight from the IG's office. Where the language has changed is if you look on the page to the designer selection procedures, um, number two and number three, um, we consulted with town council reviewed the bylaws, reviewed the town charter, and it was determined that the town manager has the authority to conduct designer selection process for the town of Reading for projects up to 1.5 million in estimated construction costs. The permanent building committee has the authority to conduct the designer selection process for the town if it exceeds 1.5 million dollars. Um, so in each town, they ask that, the IG's office asks that you fill in who has the authority. So that is what, basically what we have done is filled in um, the blanks there. Additionally, if you, this is only for projects that have four walls and a roof. It's strictly for buildings. Um, it will not affect any of your turf fields. But um, there's probably projects someday in the future also for you that would, uh, you would get um, Massachusetts School Building Authority mm -hmm. funding for. And for projects over $5 million, you go through their yeah. processes. And if it's below $5 million, um, the MSBA states that you would follow the procedures written by your respective town school district on what to follow. So the, the gist of the procedure really is that the IG's office has written out the law and the steps that you have to take to make sure you're in compliance to hire um, someone who's capable of providing the services that you need. This is this procedure kicks in for any projects where you would pay a designer over $30,000 and or the construction cost is over $300,000 if you're altering, um, building, um, repairing any buildings. Mr. Robinson. So I just, what, so what, what are we using now? What brought this about? I mean. So I th think what brought it mostly forward was your facilities department was moved over to the um, the, core. the core right the, to the town I was hired to centralize all of procurement and you had an override pass where you now have a number of capital projects coming forward so in doing that um, facilities and the town manager and Matt came to me and said okay it looks like these may be coming up in the future so I was reviewing the laws and I couldn't um, I, I couldn't see where we had adopted the language um, in this as required by the state I think um, previously was the history was like when we were under, did projects under the SBA, prior to the yes. MSBA, mm -hmm. school committee operated projects under that group of policies and the, even prior to that there had been a previous There was a previous that had been policy basically back. negated. Yep. We were with the SBA for a period of time with those policies, if I understand this right. Correct. Yep. Yes, that is correct. correct. And then now we have both the MSBA for certain conditions, but there was sort of a vacuum for So I understand that, you know, okay. but this, so basically you're saying we were kind of loose before and we're tightening things up now? Is that really what this is about? 
we even had any projects. It, part of it is well, we on the school that, that department side, we have not any. had any that would fall under this, and the, the thresholds and some of the wording in the law has changed since 2003. And this is, correct me if I'm wrong, really to ensure as we're starting to move forward with some of these larger projects that we've gone through all of the appropriate processes and procedures in making sure we have we have everything documented and buttoned down in the wording that we're using has been brought forward probably the 10 to 15 years since we've mm -hmm. had to look at it. That's so correct. it's really knowing that at November town meeting some of these projects are going to start moving forward. We want to make sure we're ready to start moving forward mm -hmm. with them at that point in time. Mr. Bob, okay. Dr. Doxer. Um, just a quick question. I'm checking my understanding, my assumption. So when it says that the approving body, it's the permanent building committee, and I, if I remember correctly, when we were at town meeting, we decided that when there were sizable projects, there would be representatives from the different parts of town involved in those projects. So if there's a school project that's being worked on, there would be a representative yes, of correct. the schools mm -hmm. yes. on that. So yes, I just wanted to... Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, did we actually... Nope. No, you need, need to read, read the motion. Okay, move to adopt the designer selection procedures. Second. Second by Mr. Bobbin. Okay, if there's no further questions, we'll take oh. a vote. Oh, you have a question? No, I, I'll just say thank you for doing this yes. to, to thank everyone. You. Like this is, it's it's really, um, we had a, a brief discussion about, you know, at another meeting about the kind of um, joint activity between the schools and the town that we're endeavoring to, you know, work together on a variety of projects that involve capital investment. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have more of those going forward. And mm -hmm. this is really terrific to see this kind of, I view this as proactive and not reactive, which which I like to see. So we're, we're following this, a consistent process across all of our government which is which is really welcome so thank you for your efforts thank you very much thank you I think we have uh, one question, yes, one question. Jeffrey Carr okay. uh, under section part 19 the following record shall be kept it doesn't specify a duration for the keeping of those records should there be a time limit five years seven years forever so the duration of keeping the records would be set by the state the state for all different types of records have that you have a record retention schedule for all of your documents but it so that's why it's not laid out in this procedure okay. but there will there is one that follows this law thank you Mr. Yeah, just one other point. I think I heard this before. I want to make sure I'm right. This is this is the identical procedure that was adopted by all the other select board and anyone yes, else. Yes, it adopted. wasn't the select board. It's the town manager that has the authority, and he okay. he adopted it. Our next stop is RMLD because they have to adopt it as well. So we'll be at their next meeting. And it's the version we it's have. It's the in front exact of. same yes. version. Yeah, yeah. thank you. We're all three. We're all Sorry, three. that's my yeah. We didn't want any inconsistencies. Which is why I took what they did, put it in the packet. We have not yes. altered. No. Uh, right. Yeah. So it's all the same. All right, so we have a motion that's been seconded. All those in favor? And that's 5 0. So great. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, no, no. I think we're on. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, RMHS guidance and then the NEASC. So um, for this presentation, I understand correctly, we're going to have uh, Ina Williams um, lead us through a portion of it and we'll hold questions until she completes her portion. So make notes wherever you want to on your slides and then, um, and then we'll have Principal Boynton do the second one. Is that correct? You have an updated slide packet, I believe. Not the one that's in the packet. There's I do not have any more no, copies. No, there should be. There should be a slide. Another packet. It's, no, I don't know. Did you pass slide? It, it only has one additional right. slide. It's that's, one slide at the very. Yeah. End. Okay. Well, that's we don't have it. We'll we'll draw it as we're watching. No. There it is. Oh, I think she's oh. them out. Does, oh, maybe. Yeah, she has them. So I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Um, for those of you that know me, you know that I love talking about college admissions, and this is one of the thank nights you. that I look forward to every night, every year. But I have to say that I did chuckle a little bit when Dr. Doherty told me that it was going to be tonight because it's November 1st, which is a huge deadline. 
for early uh, action, for early action, action yeah. and early decision for many students. So yeah. I want to congratulate all the students who um, made their deadline for today. We had about um, 15 um, students that had October 15th deadline, so they cre they creep up a little bit more every year, but, but today is a big one, so congratulations to all the um, students in the class of 2019 who made this deadline, and I'd also um, just like to say congratulations to the guidance staff, uh, because as of 5 o'clock uh, tonight, I got the last um, call from a guidance counselor saying all transcripts have been submitted so we met our deadline and um, I'm proud of all the hard work that we've done. So, Excellent. Um, Thank you. All right, so you've seen this presentation for a few years now, um, and I present a lot of data. And with this data, it's important to know that there's so many factors that go into the information. So I will try to work my way through and explain a lot of the data. Um, last year's class um, in 2000, the class of 2018 had phenomenal college acceptances wow. from yeah. students at the top of the class to you know some of our struggling students across the board we were incredibly impressed with all the admissions um, I think you guys in your packet have um, the list of college acceptances mm -hmm. uh, and then it's the list of colleges with how many students were accepted to each of the schools so for those of you that are at home um, I'm pretty sure that it's in the packet that's on your uh, website yep, it's at the end. Um, so we had an increase well first it's important to note that there were 269 students in the class of two, 2018 and as we go through the data it's important to note that this is 80 less students than the previous year which you're going to notice that in this you know the data that's reported you're going to see some significant jumps and that is largely due to the number of students in the class but with that with even with a smaller class the number of students that went off to four-year schools went up. Um, it's 91%. Um, the year before that was 86%. Um, Two-year schools went down um, to 6%. The prep and technical schools are 0.37, and then the employed slash other, which could be military, um, it could be um, gap years, and we just kind of lump them all together. It's 3%. I do realize that this is over 100%, so I just want to let you know that I do know my math, but I rounded up on all the other ones and did not with the 0.37. <laughs> it's one person. Yeah. Oh, well, that's a point slide. So where our students go? Um, so for last year's class, um, they went to 103 different four-year colleges. 74% stayed in New England. 47% stayed in Massachusetts, and of that, 23% went to state schools. 7% went to New York. 10% um, outside of um, New England and New York, and then 66% attended their first choice college. This 66% is a little bit loose, and I think that's important to note. This is student self-reporting. So where they applied, um, what they considered their first choice school, say in the September, October, November range, might be very different from their choice school once they got, they saw where they were accepted. Um, so their opinions change, and you know, um, I always say in the senior parent night as well as junior parent night that they're on this roller coaster. Parents are on this roller coaster too, so their opinions and their um, decisions change a lot um, in those few months. All right, so this is where you're going to notice um, some of the data has changed. And this is where my guidance counselors, um, we took some time um, to really talk about this. Because the first one, the number of applications, you're going to see that there's a big drop um, from the class of 2017 to the class of 2018. And I'm going to be honest, you don't know the numbers, but it's about 1,000 a 1,000 transcripts less that we sent out. And so that is a large number. And I'm like, my data has to be wrong. I don't understand, like, did I pull the data from the wrong place this year, from a different place compared to past years? And we went through it over and over and looked at all the numbers, and the numbers are all the same. And so when you look at that there's 80 less students in the class, average number of applications that our students apply to are somewhere between 6 and 10. So let's just say we take 8 just... Um, as an average, you know, that's somewhere in that 600 range. There's another um, 300 or so. 
the number of applications that students applied to just in general went down a little bit. So that's that's what we're guessing is happening here. I can't necessarily say for sure because there's just there would be requiring a lot of digging in. Um, but that was definitely interesting for us to see that there was um, less applications. We expected it, but I, it just seemed to be a greater number than what um, we anticipated. Um, obviously, the number of colleges went down a little bit. The number accepted went down. This is all due to simply that there's 80 less students. And this is just, I wanted to be consistent with how I gathered the data from the previous years. Um, and it's based off of applications, not necessarily number of students. Um, early decision, just it was a little bit less. But again, we would expect that. And the same thing for early action. Each year, you guys listen to me talk about this, and I think it's important to say it um, every year because there's always new, pa new parents that may be watching this at home who might not know the admissions process as much, and I want to make sure that um, we're talking a little bit about the criteria that the colleges are looking at when they're reviewing applications. So there's the academic portion, which is the transcripts, the level of classes, the EPA, the decile rank. Um, they're looking at extracurricular activities, so what, what are kids involved in outside of their activities? Is it the, the sports and clubs? Are they volunteering part-time jobs? Um, are they traveling? What are their standardized tests, SAT scores, ACTs? And we're going to get into more of the, and a few slides, the information as far as like our average scores and things like that, as well as APs. Um, more and more stu schools are going test optional. Um, it's every year the number is increasing, which um, for some of our students is really reducing the stress as, as far as those standardized tests. Um, so it's nice for them just to feel that they have um, options, especially if they didn't do as well on the test uh, compared to what their grades are. And then additional information. So um, anything from the essay to recommendations, um, the interviews, if they've received any honors or awards, demonstrated interest is becoming bigger and bigger with many of the schools who are tracking that. Um, and then um, if they're art students, music students, um, portfolios, auditions. So there are so many factors that go into the admissions process. And what's hard is that we don't necessarily know from college to college what they are looking for. Because sometimes colleges are looking for a very specific type of student. They may have have lost um, their star quarterback. They may have been look, looking for someone who plays the oboe. There's so many different factors that go into the admissions process um, that it's a little bit hard for us to um, specifically say, like, yes, you will get into that school. This is a safety or whatnot. Um, but it's, part, it's the part of the job that I like because it keeps me on my toes. And every year, we are learning um, new information. So here's the SAT um, mean scores for the past few years. College Board, through many of the guidance directors, for a loop this year because they decided to change the information that they were going to share with us. Um, so we really had to jump through hoops to even get this information. Um, in the past, they provide a very extensive report that talked about um, where our students were from the class of 2018, but also gave us information for the current class. That's what you would have seen if um, in the presentation from last year, because I was able to talk about the current um, class when I was presenting. This year, they're not providing that information. Um, we had to jump through hoops to even get the essay SAT subject um, mean scores. So I'm not really sure what's going on with College Board, but we are not the only school um, that is struggling with this. It's across the board, um, all over the country, this is the case. Um, our students in the 2018, so remember, um, there's less students, but the number of test takers obviously went down. But the critical reading and the math scores went up slightly. Now, what's interesting, and I have no proof of this, but this is the graduating class that when they, um, so when they were taking the PSATs, it was offered during the school day. So a few years ago, it was offered during the school day. Last year was not offered during the school day. And then this year, we offered it during the school day. Now, can I say that by offering it dur during the school day, that this is what 
increase the scores? No, but it is important for us to look at that information and then when we get the PSAT scores back this year because we've offered it during the school year and then continue to look if that is helping our students. But what I'm pleased about overall is that our scores each year go um, up a little bit. Also keep in mind the SATs changed two years ago. So you will see that there's a jump um, and we had talked about this last year um, from the 2016 to the 2017 because the, the test changed a little bit. Um, but then to go from 17 to 18, we still continue to increase, which is nice. There's no questions right now. Ms. Lee, we're going to have uh, Ms. Williams finish her presentation. We're going to do the questions at the end. This is the ACT um, data. So comparing the two bottom years from 2018 to 2017, I was a little bit surprised that the number of test takers for the ACTs dropped pretty significantly. Again, you'd expect a little bit because of the, the size in the class, but there was a pretty significant um, decrease in that, and I was just a little bit surprised. When talking with the guidance counselors trying to brainstorm why, um, the 2017, that's the year where the College Board was changing their test. So that's where a lot of um, nervous students and parents came into play. That's where there was that increase in the ACTs. I just would have expected it to ride out, you know, a little bit longer. Um, but it did not. It'll be interesting to see for the 2019. I do think that, um, I don't think for all students should take both tests, but I think that it's nice for a good portion of our students to be taking both tests to see how they do, because there are students who do better on the ACTs, and it does um, significantly help the admissions process for some students. Um, but that's not the case for all, and I also want to recognize not everybody loves taking tests. Not everybody has the time to take multiple tests. Not everybody um, feels comfortable taking them. So we really look at each individual student and what's in their best interest in working with the students and the parents. All right, our advanced placement participation. So as expected, there would be a bit of a decrease, but there's a little bit more of a decrease um, in the number of exams. Um, and it's not only because of the number, the decrease in the number of students, but it's also because of the number of AP classes that students are taking. Last year was um, a year where we did not really fully pushed the kids to take the exam. Previous years, the rule was that if you took the AP exam, you didn't have to take the final exam. Last year, um, students, if they took the AP exam, they still had to follow the school rules, which is you had to have a certain grade to exempt out of the exam. So regardless of if you took an AP exam or not, you had to have a certain grade in the class. So with that, that some students kind of elected, well, they don't want to pay the $100 to take an exam when they know th a particular college that they are going to isn't going to accept their scores. So they rather focus on the certain um, exams, study for those, do better on those exams because they know the colleges would accept those scores if they did well. So it was a strategic move on their part. It does not help us necessarily as a school where um, it affects our, our data. So. So there was a decrease in the number of exams. The total number of students decreased, as we were expected. AP scores with a three, um, three or more um, went down a little bit. And then the percentage of students with scores three or above um, went up. And that's, that's what we care about. Um, that's important data for us, um, because that's not necessarily the number of students in the class. That is how well the <coughs> students are doing who are actually taking the exam. And then there's the AP, um, the recognition. So there are AP scholars, AP scholars with honors, AP scholars with distinctions, um, and then the national AP scholars. And so, 
some of the numbers went down um, as far as the number of AP scholars and scholars with honors, um, but then the scholars with distinction, which is a score of 3.5 on all exams, and scored three or higher on five or more, that number went up. And then we had two national AP scholars, which um, are students who scored four or higher on eight or more exams. Um, so I'm really proud of the students in the class of 2018. They really did a nice job um, all around in so many areas. And then I wanted to point out some of the things that um, we've done or that we continue to do because I think that's important information as um, this is something that we place a focus on of how kids are doing um, admissions wise. So um, each year we have colleges that come into the guidance department and a few years ago it was more in that 40 50 range um, in the last two years since we switched to an online registration process I think we had about 85 students schools that came this year what we do is um, we allow the colleges to come in in the fall they are meeting with seniors um, we're strongly encouraging seniors to meet with these college reps because often these are the college reps that are um, the ones that are viewing the applications of our students so that not only are they the college is able to give information but students are um, able to get information before they're turning in applications and making connections and this goes back to what I was talking about on an earlier slide of what colleges are looking for that demonstrated interest this is one more way where um, high school students can show demonstrated interest these are not interviews this, this is purely information sessions um, in addition to the students meeting with them, we do our very best to make sure that guidance counselors are meeting with college reps too. One, we want to highlight all the wonderful things that are going on in the high school. Um, sometimes we're talking to them about specific students, um, especially the students who have attended the session because many of the college reps will ask questions about certain students, so it's a nice opportunity for us to advocate. Um, but we are also gathering information from the colleges that is important for us to know as we continue to guide um, students in the admissions process. So anything from what they're looking for in the uh, student to any changes they've had on campus. Um, you know, at one point we wanted to know information about how they handle discipline issues. Um, and we were trying to gather information about APs. These are opportunities for us to get our information from colleges, which is nice because sometimes it's a little bit hard to break away to get to all the college campuses year after year after year so um, we continued with our fall cooperative college fair so Reading organizes the fair for eight different high schools at Shriners um, every year the number of students decreases so it's something that we kind of talk about do we should we be continuing this the reality is that by the time seniors are coming into their senior year they know where they're applying or they have a very good idea of where they're applying at the same time you know trying to push this where there's more sophomores and juniors coming but sometimes those students because it's the fall it's a little bit early for them to wrap their head around so um, i'm having a conversation with the um, the guidance directors who work with me on the college fair about what we do to increase participation um, there was discussion about moving it into the spring when there would be more juniors that would have their head like in it and ready to like talk to these college reps the difficult piece is the timing because when the colleges want to do it it's april and for those of you that know what goes on in april at the high school it's an incredibly um what, what, how should I say it? It's a, an incredibly busy time with all the award ceremonies, the AP exams going on, the SATs, and um, to add the college fair into that would be a little bit difficult. But um, it's something that we are talking with the area high schools of what to do for that. Um, continuing with the flex block senior seminars so in the senior exit survey for um, that the guidance department does um, we ask for feedback on the things that are helpful to the students in this the senior seminar flex block comes up as one um, that many students find helpful this year because I have a smaller caseload than the rest of the counselors um, 
Well, let me back up. All the seniors had three senior seminars, but because I have a smaller caseload, I'm able to offer um, an additional one, and I did it as an optional session just for them to come down um, and be able to eat with me, and they can just work on their college apps. There was no curriculum to it. It was just being in a computer lab, and they could work on any part of the college admissions process, but with me being there. And I have to say, with it being optional, I was surprised that majority of my students showed up and they were busy from the beginning of the period to the very end. So it's a clear sign that the kids um, find this time useful. They want the help. Um, and I also like that I know that they're working on their applications. So. Um, we opened the door for juniors to take AP US History this year, and we also offered um, AP English Language and Composition. Sometimes when there's a new class that's offered, only a small number of students signed up, but I, um, I should have looked at the exact number, but I, um, there's two sections, um, and, it's, and they're both full. So it's nice um, to have that opportunity because I think um, for many years, we had a very heavy math science focus with the APs, and it's nice that we are opening it up to more of the humanities classes. We moved, um, for this year, the junior parent night is going to be earlier. Um, it's gonna be in January. This is, um, many parents have said that um, we need to start this process earlier. We, we know um, that we wanna be able to do visits during the February and April break, so we are moving up the junior parent night, which also means that we are moving up the junior seminars. The goal for this year, and I'm hoping with my partner here <laughs> that we are gonna make this happen, um, that all the junior seminars um, guidance seminars will be done before we start the scheduling process, um, picking classes for next year, so we're not doing two things at once, which can be quite stressful for us and stressful for the kids. Um, we continued this year with the junior English classes, working on the college essay, so they start the college essay junior year. Um, just as a beginning draft, then we're asking students to work on it over the summer, and then when they come in senior year, they can actually talk to any, se any English teacher, whoever they have had, nine through 12, and work with them during their flex block. And the senior teachers have been really great about working with our um, students, so I think it's a nice free resource for um, our students, and many of them have taken advantage of that. Um, as I stated earlier, we offered the PSATs um, during the school year this year. That was partly due to College Board is making it a little bit difficult for us to be getting information back. And we wanted to make sure that the students had access to um, their test booklets and they had full reports um, that they were getting and also we are getting the full reports of how the students are doing. If we offered it on a Saturday, um, the students, parents, and the school would not be getting that information. So that was the main reason why we did it. On a positive note, what happened is that we had about 550 students taking the PSATs here, um, and that was due to the fact that it was during the school day, which is, um, in the past, it was around 350 took it on the SAT um, on a Saturday. And I also just want to thank all the teachers because there were 64 teachers who are writing recommendations for our students. Um, and this is and just important to know because um, each time a teacher writes a recommendation, they're spending anywhere between a half an hour to an hour of their own time. And we have 12 teachers that are writing um, anywhere between 20, and we have a teacher who's writing 55 recommendations. Um, so this, I just thought it was important to know because this is just another way that that the teachers are really trying to be part of this process and help our students and make sure that they um, do well in the process. All right, I talked a lot. <laughs> That's presentation. <laughs> All right, we'll take a question from the committee members. Ms. Sprowski. So thank you, that was a wonderful, again, another wonderful presentation. Um, I was particularly happy to see the list of college, colleges where our graduates were accepted. So that's something I get asked in the public a lot. So I'd love to find opportunities that we can expand that even further than school committee package. So that's something to think about at graduation time. I know it's published within the school community well, but I think everyone in the community um, who pays taxes would love to see some of the schools our seniors are being into. It makes me very proud every year. So, um, and the information is great and I appreciated it. I do have one note maybe for next year. On several of the slides, I found myself writing, could we see a percent, could we see a percent? So okay. when it's, you know, number of kids taking the AP, 
class because that's so dependent on the size of the class. You don't know what's causing it. So I'd love to see percent of students taking an AP class, percent of students, you know, short. Um, AP placement recognition. Mm -hmm. Percent of students came across the board, so I would I'd love next year to see that if, okay. if it's possible to get that data. But sure. thank you very much. Yeah. Skaransky, thank you. Um, if I can just add, so that one, um, I think to that point, the the data when you look at that AP, the number of exams per students really didn't change much. The charts look like there's a lot of change, but the number of exams per student didn't change, um, and that's um, I think something you know that you'd be we'd also be wanting to look at and see as we are able to potentially offer more AP, you know, how did, will that help shift that? Um, and of course, there are a lot of factors that you mentioned that, you know, pertain to whether or not they decide to actually take the test or not. Um, uh, yep. Mr. Robinson. I just had a question on the slide where you showed, <coughs> excuse me, the, the SAT scores, you showed the state average. Is that available for the, because I think the AC, the ACT? Oh, it's there. I didn't see that. Um, so ACT, ACT has it at the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed yeah. that. Down at the very bottom. <coughs> Um, on the slide, the state average of SATs, um, I think you pointed it out and it's a different color text, but I think it would be good to note that the SAT changed in 2017. Yes. Because uh, people who don't know that or remember that would say, you know, boy, that class of 2017. I'm uh, sorry, my son was class of 2016. Um, you know, what, what would they do? Were they asleep during the test? No. Um, so I think just to make sure to actually explicitly note that the test changed that year. Okay. Mr. Bach. I think. Oh, mine would be Stock, Dr. Doxer. Um, first of all, thank you so much. These presentations are really helpful, and thank you. I know how challenging it is to get all those reports in by deadlines, and um, Ms. Dowd, you did it too. Um, thank you. Um, and to the guidance counselors and all the teachers that are going above and beyond to get those references in. I've written many myself, and, and actually, a half to an hour is a low estimate on how long it takes, so thank you for that. I'm wondering, and I'm thinking, maybe I missed it, but I'm not sure. You referenced the 80 less students that we have in this graduating class, and I'm wondering if we have any idea, is that 80 less that started in kindergarten, or are we losing students at certain transition points, or just wondering where that no, the, 80 the, If you remember the year before that, we had a very, very large oh, class. Yeah. And we, this class has been small coming through the whole time. Was, thank you. Yeah. I, I yes. thought perhaps I had heard it before, but I forgot. Yeah. And keep in mind that's 2018 was last. So now 2019, we are back up, I think, yeah. at like 330. That's, that's correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So again, thank you. Always, always a great presentation. Good year on this. Thank you. Um, great news for everyone involved. Um, I have two numbers of questions because I usually like to ask this. I, I knew that you were going to ask this number. <laughs> I was going to answer it. So, um, I so, so it is, I think they're easy. Um, Go back a few slides. The SAT mean scores, those are the 2018 averages you were showing. Yes. Right. Uh, that's the, the fives are all 2018. So that's the point. Okay. Oh, they don't have the year. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not like some overall average of everything above, uh, right? No, sorry. This is the 2018. Correct. Yes. Okay. And then let's moving to the advanced placement recognition slide, second from the end. After Next this. One? Next one, yeah. yeah, so so these are non you don't add a student count a student more than once in these numbers. So if you sum the chart under twenty eighteen you get fifty five, I think, if I did my math correctly. And if you divide by two sixty nine, that's like one in five kids. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't, I, I didn't teach her, but I wasn't here. <laughs> to, to, to everyone. Yeah, I organized those exams so well. <laughs> so I, I, I'll let someone else talk, but I have other questions. Yeah. Okay. Those just so that that's done by AP. Those right, right, right. 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 Yes. You, you get the letter from AP. Understood. You did this. Yeah. And obviously, yes. guidance gets the info too. Uh, uh, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Bobbin, for your 
very fast math right there because that is exactly why percentages I think are helpful. That's yeah. a perfect example where you look and you say, okay, it looks good, I don't and then you hear that. It's one in oh, five. Oh my gosh, like that's three, exactly why I think the percentages are helpful. Three threes, Something. that's hard to do. You made my point better. A lot of hours <laughs> uh, for everyone. Um, I, different question. Yeah, so um, I, getting away from numbers and just thinking about what we're trying to measure and what we could measure, do we have any feedback from former students or any kind of accounting, how many students graduate in five or fewer years, how they like their college experience, if they thought it was a good choice retrospectively? Um, so I do not specifically have that information. There is a way that we can um, this um, information through Naviance and they can do that. Um, so that's a possibility. Um, also, uh, the state, state, um, colleges, we state do. colleges, we have that information, but not necessarily all the private, private ones. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just wondering for parents, obviously, that what can you say about financial aid and, and kind of what you see? I, I don't know if that it's too early in the year this year to have any assessment of that, but that's obviously a huge component of this decision. Maybe you can speak to that about how you talk to parents about that, how you talk to students, and what your experience is. I avoid that conversation at all costs. No. <laughs> um, we bring in someone to talk about the financial aid um, process, and um, it's Marsha Toomey. She's the director of financial aid at college, who's absolutely wonderful. She does a presentation every year to our. Um, to our families, um, and she really walks students through the FAFSA, and um, many parents have found that incredibly um, helpful. As far as the guidance department, we're making sure that parents know what forms that they need to fill out, um, but we're not getting into the details of specifically um, you know, their finances unless they're sharing information with us about, we can only afford a certain type of school. What do you think that this means? Is like how much colleges, like this particular college, are they known for giving um, scholarships and awards and things like that? So we help them out just on a, a, a basic level of that information. If I could, I'll, I'll make a little plug though. Yeah. There is, the state organizes Fast for Training Day. I'm going to have my package because yes. <laughs> I'm a volunteer trainer, which this Sunday at the, um, this Sunday at the Salem Charter, Salem Academy Charter School at, um, oh my gosh, in Salem at, uh, on, on Congress Street. I, I just lost it. I go by, I'm, I'm in this place almost every week. Um, so it's all over the state. So people can, parents can look it up online, you know, and I think it's probably on a lot of the websites. It's basically a help day where a parent can go in with their information and someone will help them fill out the FAFSA right. and get them yes. through it. So it's a great service that the yeah. state offers. Um, I'm not sure if we've been good at publicizing that or not, but we, it's a little, um, I, I don't know exactly how the state reaches out, like to guidance offices, to say yeah. publicize this. I just know I get tapped every year. You get to you, so. uh, one last question: yeah. uh, When you is there any kind of pattern with when, when I'm looking for the number that was in here? I think it was two thirds or sixty percent that reported uh, you know, being admitted to their first choice. Is is does that number change depending on whether they were early decision or not? Um, so that's, are you, so, ask that again. Sure, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> is there, do, do more students get their first choice if they apply early decision oh, and if I they don't, and is, is there an effect of not applying early decision where people, for whatever reason, have a harder time getting to where they want to go? Yeah, so there are advantages and disadvantages to applying early decision. And for some schools, there is a higher number of students that would be accepted early decision mm -hmm. versus regular, but that's not all schools. Mm -hmm. So we're definitely encouraging families to get that information when they're trying to make that decision. As far as our information, as far I think it was 60% or something, um, first choice, I, I don't, I didn't, dig deep into the information as far as like I have the information of how many got accepted early decision I just I don't know why I didn't think about putting it in this presentation but it's something that I can make sure that we do for um, future years yeah. great Anything else? Um, uh, Mrs. Lieberman 
Yeah, I just had a really quick question about the uh, SAT average scores, and I wondered if you could show um, the median. You know how the way it is on the colleges, you know, the median SAT scores are X to Y. It would just be really helpful to see it the exact same way for Reading. Thanks. Okay, then we'll go on to yes. the point. Can you ask? Part two. In the ASC. Great, thank you. I just want to put a little plug in for the guidance department here as well. I'm a parent of a senior and I've relied heavily on their advice for college applications and uh, the senior parent and student timeline checklist has been incredibly helpful for me. So thank you, Lynn. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the Reading Memorial High School uh, NIASC self-study update and can share the members of our committee, um, two co-chairs, Danielle Thiessen, Jen Pagopian, and then teachers Christina Clausen, Patrick Daly, Charles Strout, Natalie Cuna, Tim McIntyre, Shelley Lynch, Craig Murphy, and Allison Williams. So it's a very well-represented team, multiple departments, um, and I have to really just put a plug to our two co-chairs. Um, they have been phenomenal in their planning, in their organization, in their sensitivity, um, in their support of the self-study um, and reflection team, uh, and then kind of onboarding me uh, into this process as well. So um, they've done a, a phenomenal job, so a big shout out to them. The process really began um, last fall um, with uh, the prior principal and the two co-chairs attending a training um, and where they learned the major steps of the process which are outlined here for the public uh, secondary school accreditation. Um, it's multi-dimensional and also kind of a continuous process. I do have to say as well that um, for a long time Reading Memorial High School as well as uh, a number of schools in the state pulled out of the NEASC process um, and really gave um, the organization some critical feedback. John Doherty was a part of that um, in order to make the process more meaningful for schools and less onerous. And so now um, the process that uh, RMHS is going through is the new, uh, the new um, accreditation process. And from what uh, I've seen and from the feedback that I've heard really from our co-chairs, from the self-study committee, and then from faculty members as well, um, having gone through the approval process for our self-study, um, it has been a meaningful process so far. Um, and so that the, the NIASC took that feedback and I believe has made um, a, the process much, much better and more meaningful for schools. So the process begins with a self-reflection and that started last year. So the committee worked really for a full school year on this self-reflection process and over the summer as well um, as they collected data and then began to write their reports. Um, the next step is the collaborative conference. That occurs um, for us next week. Uh, so next Thursday and Friday, November 8th and 9th, we have four members of um, our NIASC Collaborative Conference team coming to visit um, the high school. I'll share with you the schedule in just a few slides. Um, so at that collaborative conference, uh, the first day is really they embed themselves within the fabric of the school day. They meet with multiple stakeholders. They look at evidence. Um, and then the second day, they meet with any group they feel they need to ask additional questions to, someone they, a question came up and maybe they didn't get an opportunity to meet with that particular group, so they will pull people as needed and, and the, the two co-chairs are ready to help facilitate that. And then they write their report um, and their findings um, and then the end of the, the day they meet with me to share those findings and recommendations. Um, the next step in that process is the school growth plan um, and development and imp implementation of that um, growth plan and then a um, decennial accreditation visit and then it's that ongoing cycle after that. So this is directly from the, the NIAS website. I, I felt these two visuals were really helpful in understanding the cyclical nature of the accreditation process as well as where we are. We're falling under the fall 2020 schools and um, by winter, spring, uh, we needed to have completed our self-reflection. We were a little bit behind. We ended up completing our self-reflection just this fall. Uh, I think the change in leadership was part of the delay in finalizing that, um, that report. And so we had our, um, 
our vote, the faculty voted on the, the self-study back on October 10th and uh, unanimously approved the findings of the self-study and then the faculty also identified some additional areas of need, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we then uh, host our collaborative visit and help develop a growth plan with NEASC, so that is now fall winter of 2018. And then we implement the growth plan beginning in the winter spring of 2019. Much of this will be coincided with findings from my entry plan. There seems to be lots of dovetailing with, um, with findings, and so it, it'll coordinate quite nicely. Uh, continue to implement the growth plan uh, into the winter and spring, writing a summary, and then in 2020, in the winter, we will host uh, their visit and then update the growth plan moving forward. And so you can see that cyclical nature of the process. So we found several areas of, of growth, and um, NIAS has identified two foundational elements. And we are lacking in both of those foundational elements. However, work is being done to address them as we speak. So the first foundational element, it's um, describing, uh, we've uh, an identified document describing our core values, beliefs about learning, vision, and really the vision of the graduate. Who do we want our students to be when they cross that, um, that stage and receive their diploma? And so we're beginning work now with um, the uh, creation and finalization of a school improvement plan to have steps um, in the process of, of creating that vision for the graduate. And then the second foundational element is a written curriculum um, for that is in a consistent format for all courses in all departments. I've been working very closely with Chris Kelly, our assistant superintendent, and all departments, uh, their um, professional learning goal this year, their common learning goal, is to create these curriculum guides uh, for sharing out with the public. So that is work that we recognize as an area of need and growth for us um, not only in the NIAS process, but to help us communicate out to families what are those learning expectations um, that we have for all students, for all learners here at the high school. And so that is a, that is a goal for this year. And um, we are, um, various departments are in various stages of progression and finalization. We just received uh, a draft from our first health batch. and uh, first batch from uh, several departments, including health and wellness and I believe science. And so that'll be an ongoing um, process of taking a look drafting, having department heads um, give each other feedback, and we um, absolutely expect to have those documents completed um, in the springtime mm -hmm. and for sharing out uh, with, uh, with the, the school and the greater Reading community. So those are foundational elements. These are like the non-negotiables <coughs> for, uh, for NEASC. The staff identified additional principles sort of subcategories that they felt areas of, uh, for growth um, that should the school and the district should consider. Principle 5.2 is about financial resources um, to enable research-based curriculum, professional growth and development. So really, I boil that down into professional development and meaningful, ongoing professional development that has an impact in the classroom um, in how teachers are, are teaching our students. Um, and so we've been working again, the work with um, Landmark uh, is part of that process in providing that meaningful professional development. Principle 5.3, the community and the district's governing body provide adequate and um, dependable funding to fully implement the curriculum, in including, including co-curricular programs and other learning opportunities. I think that's just a, a recognition of um, making sure our resources are allocated in, in the direction and the location that they should be. Um, and making sure that we're making informed decisions. I would say um, our work with the science curriculum has been a move in the right direction, and then naturally with the, the shift in the, um, and the, the new curriculum frameworks and social studies, that's gonna be an area. And our faculty just wants to make sure that we're allocating resources where there, there is a need. Um, principle 5.4, the school and district has short and long-term plans to address the capital and maintenance needs of its building and facilities. Um, our MHS is a hot building sometimes. Um, it's, it's warm on the, on the fourth floor. I think that's um, what this was speaking to. I, the day that they filled out the survey, I think, was a warm day. And <laughs> it's in recognition. Some, some of the classrooms are not air-conditioned and some are. Um, and that's, we just have to recognize that's part of the, the how, how faculty are feeling in the building on certain days. Um, and so I believe that's what that is. The building is clean, it's well maintained, well taken care of, so none of those are issues. I believe it has to do with the air conditioning um, situation. So that's what 
that's what that's about. Let's get to the, the conference visit, which I'm very excited for. So on November 8th, um, the co-chairs and myself will greet the visiting team uh, between 7.30 and 7.40. Um, we'll bring them up here. They'll be housed in the library uh, for um, both days, um, largely in the conference room, but then some meeting time here in the greater part of the library. We have six students, uh, or some ROD ambassadors, who will be um, giving them a tour from 7.45 to 8.30. They then will be meeting with central office staff between 8.30 and 9.15. They'll take a break, and then they'll meet with the steering committee and self-reflection committee uh, during the break um, for a half an hour. <coughs> One of the key components is classroom visits, and um, they will be traveling with co-chairs and myself on classroom visits for half an hour, um, uh, just before lunchtime. They will gather, and um, they have discretion to eat lunch in the cafeteria with students. Um, we've also set aside room 105, the room off of the cafeteria, if they so choose to eat lunch near where students are eating to get sort of a vibe, but have some, some um, privacy to themselves. They also have the opportunity to grab and go lunch in the cafeteria and, um, and come up to the conference room and continue working. It sort of depends on the flow of the day for them. Uh, at uh, after lunch, they break off and are um, meeting um, in teams of two, uh, either with students or parents and then either with uh, support personnel or teachers. And support personnel include our guidance counselors, um, some special educators, our social workers, so anybody that provides a uh, support role with students uh, at, in uh, the high school. Following that, they meet with the, our department heads, and then at the end of the day, they, meet, uh, they will meet with me and the rest of my administrative team. And, that, um, and that's a very full day. Second day, they will have breakfast at their hotel and uh, and check out of the hotel. Two of them are staying in the hotel, and part of the requirement is that we do pay for a hotel room for um, any members who stay. They may travel from uh, from out of state, or they're um, it's a New England group, so they may travel from out of state or from the western part of the state. Uh, so two two me ask. Um, collaborative conference members have um, asked to stay in a hotel. The other two live locally enough that they will not be. Um, they'll arrive at school at 7.30 and they begin writing. Um, and this, this is the process where they will ask to meet with anybody else that they need to meet with, any groups, maybe the, the school nurse, the, the librarian, um, perhaps facilities. Joe Huggins is available to meet with them if they have any facilities questions, um, myself. Um, and then from 1 to 1.45, they will brief with me and share their report. Wow, great. And then, then the real work begins. Um, so that, and I will happily take any questions. Um, we're excited for their visit and are eager to see and hear their recommendations. I guess this is for Lena. Uh, have we found that any, because, because we're kind of on hold right now, right, we're, we'd be credit with this. Have we seen any pushback from any colleges? No. No. And when um, when I first started six years ago, this was something that Dr. Doherty had right. asked me to research and right. had contacted about 50 colleges or so. Um, and we have not seen any negatives um, from, it's also on our profile that we are still accredited, so that also right. helps and would not be a red flag to any colleges. So. Thank you. I, yeah, we didn't we didn't lose accreditation. I think that the right. accreditation yeah, we did not hold yeah. 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 So, yeah. But we could have decided not to do this. Yes, yes, yes. we could have yes. made that decision. I think had Niesk not heard the feedback, that might have been a way the district decided to go, but they did hear feedback from multiple districts. It was really a coordinated effort on the part of superintendents. Um, to and they cut their rate, right, too? Yeah, it, is, it is cheaper, yes. But you pay for the hotel. Um, yeah. Sprowski, just a quick comment. Um, thank you for that. It was really informative and helpful, so thank you. Um, but it, this is really just a comment. I know that several years ago, Dr. Doherty took a little bit of heat for the decision to sort of push back and say this isn't a process that works. And in another lifetime, I was involved in an accreditation of a high school process 
um, under the old system and having so seen mm -hmm. both sides, that this seems infinitely improved. This really, I just, I just wanted to bring that perspective to the committee that this seems like a much better process to me. So yeah. it seems like that sort of difficult conversation that had to happen a couple of years ago seems well worth it. So. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have a quick question. If we can go to the slide on the foundational elements. Yeah. So on this um, sort of the vision of the graduate, at least about most of the vision of the graduate, I was wondering, you know, what um, parts of the student body would involve. And I guess specifically, I'm, I'm wondering if you would query graduates to get their reflection on, right, like what pieces of the things that they got and who they were when they left Reading, you know, what are those things that they take with them and that they've been able to leverage in college or their professional life? So I just didn't know what you're, maybe to talk a little bit about the plan. I think that's a fabulous idea and I have heard anecdotally, and we don't have hard evidence, that our graduates are very well prepared mm -hmm. compared to their counterparts in college. Um, in particular, the math department um, was given uh, accolades uh, for the level of preparation um, that our students felt um, compared to other, mm -hmm. compared to their classmates. So I think that would be some valuable information mm -hmm. for us to have and if we could find and a I, way to do that. I'm thinking also just so like... Linda would like to add. Oh, hey. Great. On that note, um, and one of the things that um, Ms. Boynton doesn't know, that we have an alumni day in January where we bring back a good, about 20 um, alumni and they meet with the senior class and it, the, the goal of the alumni day is really to inform the current seniors how to transition to college and what to expect and what to prepare. But after that, we have um, the alumni meet with administration um, and department heads and guidance counselors where we get to ask them the questions of what did they find helpful um, from when they were in red and what prepared them the most. So I think it's going to be really nice um, for Kate to hear that um, and it's great information for us each year. So that could be something that we use. I'm actually thinking just a little bit beyond that too and I, I have the good fortune of working my professional career with graduates, some of which are not my children, some of which are my children. But um, what I see, and um, you know, is the type of people. There's some like core skills about who you are, what kind of courage you have, what kind of confidence you have, um, that enable you to be productive in a workplace where maybe the average age is 50 six of eighty percent of the people you work with and how do you do that so I'm thinking I know that's great but I'm if I, when you say vision right of the graduate I was thinking you know what is so what's that root thing that's going to take them to that level of success I have no idea how you you know access that other than I don't know I don't know you know finding out which graduates might be in the local area that so anyway, that, that, I think those are great things to, to think about. So not just the classes that they took or but the, the person they are, the core values that they yeah, like, yeah. What did they learn through their trials and their, their experience here at Reading? Like what are there things that they can point to? I'm not really like asking like for these young people in their I would say, you know, I'm talking about twenty two to twenty fours, those that group. I wonder if we could, could get some picture of, ask them to be reflective about what was it that when that they got from here that they now can see has taken them not just through their college journey but helped them to start out and be successful in a career because to the parents who helped pay for all that college, that's what matters, <laughs> right? Like can they be successful in a career? Um, or life. Mr. Robbins? Yeah. Kate, I had a, another question on the uh, the next slide after the so I think you said this was based on a study from or a survey from teachers or staff or yes so um, the process uh, of the, the self-study process includes um, sharing the results of the self-study, the findings of the self-study committee, and then it's t um, put to a, a vote uh, for the faculty, and the faculty then, in that vote, it's, it's a kind of a prescribed formula, if you will, that the questions that we need to ask. So the faculty approves uh, or does not approve the findings of the self-study, 
and can approve with, with conditions, like approve it, but here on this, I think you missed, might have missed the mark on this one, and maybe you got, we, you, the self-study rated us in this principle too high or too low, so they were able to give that feedback. But then they were also able to identify, as a part of the, the survey, um, other areas that they felt the school needed to work on. So when when the yes. So when the group comes in next week, they will they see this. Focus yes. on this. So not just those three. They will right. see the entire self study, and they will see the results of the, the survey results. Oh, okay. So they, we will share so that. So how many questions were on the survey? Or? I want to say maybe five. Because it, I mean. They're, they're walking into a 10-year-old building that's beautiful, and it's almost embarrassing that we put that principal 5.4 on there. And that even, I mean, that that really makes me angry that that's, you know, we're, yeah, I understand we're that. gonna spend time talking about, uh, oh, I know it's not you, but thank you. Thomas? All right. Um, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And thank you for your support. I appreciate it very much. Yes. yes. We appreciate you. Um, our next uh, agenda item actually is the approval of the calendar. Mm -hmm. Dr. Darty, you want to get us started? Yes. In your packet, there is a memo and the uh, draft of the 2019-20 calendar. Um, there really is only one change from uh, this year to next year, and, but I'll go, I'll go through some of the highlights. So um, as, and this, this was shared uh, per the collective bargaining agreement with the RTA for the, and to uh, consult, which, which they did give feedback on. So, um, as you can see, school is going to begin for teachers on Monday the 26th. Students, for students, it'll be August 28th. Um, we'll have uh, the five in service days. Two will be before school begins. Uh, one will be the election day. One will be the conference day, um, which is on the 15th. Mm -hmm. Um, and then one will be on March 20th. And so those are the five non-student days. Uh, there are five snow days built into the schedule. Actually, for the last few years, we have used all five. Uh, some years we've used more than that. Um, it's always our hope to try to not use our snow days, but right now, if we use all five snow days, it would be June 22nd, uh, 2020. Um, if we use less, then we would go away at that based on the number of snow days that we use. If we use more than five snow days, then you add a day to the calendar after the 22nd. So you just keep going. Um, Veterans Day this year is uh, on Monday, the 11th, so that is also a holiday. Um, and the big change, the one change, the one change that we did make is because there's a lot going on in September and October this year, we are moving, um, and this is some feedback we received from the RTA, we are moving the Friday before Columbus Day half day, which we used as a professional development day this year, uh, to the Martin Luther King weekend uh, Friday. So that, that's just a shift. Um, there will be a half day for students and um, teachers will be the, in the afternoon will be having professional development. So that's the one change uh, from uh, this year's calendar. And that was in part from working with the RTA and yep. they wrapped That's feedback that we received from the RTA, yes. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions from committee members? Dr. Doc. Um, Thank you for being so careful. I know we've had conversations about um, the pressure around the fall and how many um, challenging days there are. I'm wondering if you have any feedback, any statistics from this year about the, the holidays. I appreciate that you include 
the holidays in the calendar so people understand where they're hap when they're happening. Do you have any feedback on attendance? On I, I don't have any feedback with me right now, no. Okay. Any sense of whether it's state stable or? Yeah, it was, it was pretty much the same as it's been in the previous few years. Thank you. Um, can we need to make the motion, I think, Dr. Doxer? Okay, I move to approve the 2019-20 school calendar. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Robinson. Is there more discussion? None being seen. May I take a vote? Oh, um, just like just like the very end. Just okay. at the end. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so maybe someone could just quickly kind of the the days that we have professional development on the calendar are those I don't know if earmarked is the right term but are there uh, are, I, I know that there there um, a certain number that are specified in in the contracts that we agree to and so forth but I'm sure about what we do during those days is it the same every year or do we have anything earmarked or are we just saving the space and then we make decisions later about how we use that time so I, in her report mrs. Kelly talked about what's happening on November 6th right um, the March date very similar a lot of professional development activities going on um, the two days before school starts a lot of that is building based um, classroom preparation for the start, a lot of meetings going on, talking about students, um, special education meetings going on. So those two days, uh, which are actually defined in the contract to happen before school starts. And then the conference day on the 16th is a conference day for elementary and high school and middle school is also, it's a professional development day, which I believe Mrs. Kelly talked about as well. Yeah, so that was for this year, right? So this is for the following year. Right, it, it would be similar use, activities. We use this the same, roughly the same date in the month for the same type of activity and correct for calendars. Is that the way it's worked? In correct, the yes. Okay. And the professional development's all tied into our district improvement plan, school improvement plan goals. Ms. Robinson? Oh, no, I was told. Oh, we're ready. Okay, well, <laughs> we're ready. Yep. Um, just um, maybe for next year when we do consider the calendar, those statistics in terms of the um, number of absences, the attendance statistics would be really helpful if we are ending up getting a lot of substitute teachers on the holidays or a lot of students are absent. That would be an important thing to keep track of in terms of whether school's best in or best out. Mm -hmm. on the we, we could certainly get you that information for this year. I will tell you that there was not a big so change. Okay. And I'm um, trusting the big, that. The big change is it, the, where we've seen the change is Good Friday. Yeah. Which we talked about last Friday. year. Right. And Morning. Good Friday this year is actually during vacation, so right. It's, right. it won't have an impact this year. Right. I'm not doubting your word on the stability of it. I just... Um, there's a lot going on and we're becoming much more aware of the community the Jewish community in town and so it would be good to have just an idea of those statistics are changing so thank you okay all of those in favor and it's five zero great much on track. okay our next item is um, just sort of a discussion on the kindergarten um, assignment process. And Dr. Gardy has provided uh, a memo. Um, Dr. Gardy, if you want to start anything, if not, I can sort of do it. Sure, I can. Um, so uh, there, if you recall June 4th, I did an entire presentation uh, on kindergarten. Um, tonight I'm not planning on doing a presentation. I'm just going to walk you through uh, the information. Um, and also we had our kindergarten parent orientation meeting um, on uh, Tuesday night. Uh, the PowerPoint for that presentation is in your packet. And so what, what else is in the packet is the registration letter that went out to all prospective 19 and 20 families. I also wanted to include for you the school committee policy JC on attendance areas and then uh, the, the PowerPoint presentation. So um, 
as I mentioned to you in the June 4th presentation, we currently have uh, three elementary schools with half-day programs this year. There are 38 students out of the 325. I believe that's uh, the that's 11% of the total kindergarten, kindergarten population. Our half day, 89% is full day. Um, all three half day programs are doing very well. Um, and the students have made adjustments to the new schools if they were attending a, a different school than, than their uh, attendance area school. So we are now beginning the enrollment process for the 1920 school year. Um, where, and as we communicated to the parents the other night, what we are trying to do is to effectively and efficiently maximize the educational space and staffing. Um, in an ideal world, we would have all of our kindergarten classes in one building, and we would be able to, through economy of scale, be able to balance those class sizes for both half day and full day. We don't have an early childhood center, so we have to rely on the available space that we have in, in each of our five schools. Um, most of our schools, we have three classrooms that are dedicated to kindergarten. Sometimes it's four, sometimes it's two, depending on other space needs um, in the building, special education programs. Uh, we do have Rise Preschool in three of our uh, buildings. Um, so uh, those, those are factors uh, that also impact the number of space uh, the space that we have. So our goal, and it has been, it has been a puzzle for the last, since 2010, when we started this process, to try to balance and maximize the space so that we can effectively offer full day and half day kindergarten programs to all of our students. The factors that we are using in our priority is giving students access to full day kindergarten for families that want it or qualify for it. I explained all this the other night to the, to the uh, kindergarten families. Obviously maintaining the school committee guidelines for class size. I'm happy to report that all of the half day classes this year are actually 16 and under. Um, so which you know are, are good sizes. You don't want to go too low on though uh, in terms of numbers because then it's not an effective uh, kindergarten classroom. Um, as you heard from kindergarten teachers last year, trying to keep half day and full day classes separate and not integrated. Um, is to make it more uh, educationally sound for both programs. Um, if there's a half day, full day program in the same school, making sure the siblings are in the same school, one of the things that we did explain the other night, and I think it's in the PowerPoint, is um, if, if students are in a half day program and they do have to go to another school um, and they have a sibling in their attendance area school, then in grade one they will go back to that, to that school. And then maintaining the elementary attendance areas. Um, so the timeline that you see there in the memo, so on October 1st all of the letters went out to all of the prospective kindergarten families that we were aware of. We have re continued to receive phone calls for families that were not in the census. That's our primary uh, means of finding out uh, who the families are to send out letters. Um, and we have received several um, new families that it, were not on the census. And also there are families that are on the census that are no longer in Reading. So, um, but sometimes we don't find out about those until much later in the process. Uh, December 7th is when all the applications are due. Uh, February 1st is when our goal is to notify families about the program that they're in in the school assignment. And then kindergarten screening this year is in May and June of 2019. One of the things that we mentioned um, the other night at, at the uh, parent meeting um, is we encourage parents to choose the program that is best for their child and their family. And we couldn't emphasize that enough. Um, because if we don't have a true sense of the numbers, we can't then figure out the class sizes based on, on, on different data. So we encourage families to do that. There were questions about, well, um, if we, can we put both um, to assure that we stay in the same school as um, 
the other siblings that are in there and we said absolutely um, again it will be dependent upon what how many other students are in each program in that building um, so I know I know uh, the people would want more definitive answers but because of our space needs and resource needs and the fact that we do know how many want each program we can't give more definitive answers right now hopefully uh, after December 7th we will mm -hmm. and I, I was um, at the meeting and um, I think the principals all did an excellent job um, two three principals uh, four. four. There were four of the five of them. Four of the five. Four, four of the five participated in various parts of the presentation. I think it was very good, and I think it was really, it was clear that um, parents, when they asked the questions, you know, to put down what they really felt was best for their child, and then indicate, you know, but if that's if 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 I attending the school and the attendance area, the neighborhood school is important and you know, you're going to weigh that over the program, indicate that. And I think um, Dr. Darty made that really clear and I, I believe there were, I was hearing conversations, you know, that people were having after with the principals and, you know, just asking really good questions. I think it's um, been a long time since I've been there. And so it was very interesting to, you know, again, listen to the first time parents and um, the principals were just absolutely outstanding at making the parents feel comfortable and you know come to the um, kindergarten screening and you know it's not like this a commitment if you then decide a parent was asking you know what if what if you know they're sort of um, younger they're a little bit young you know and what should I do and they were just great at saying just come to the screening and if it's not what you want if that's what we work out then we'll We'll take whatever path is the best for your child. So that was excellent. The, the last piece I just want to say, um, we had probably about 180 parents there. Uh, we had 150 handouts. They were all gone, and there were there was a bunch of people that didn't get handouts. So my guess, we had about 180, uh, which that seemed to be the highest number that we've yeah. had in a lot. I mean, usually we usually get about 125 to 150. Um, it was definitely more this year. Yeah, it was packed. Packed. Dr. Doctor. Uh, just two things. One, um, I was thinking that it must have been fun for you to be back because you, Madam Chair, were president there a long yeah. time ago. We were both had our kids there, so that must have been kind of fun. I just want to clarify, I love going back there. Um, I just wanted to clarify my understanding. So you're encouraging people to let you know if they're interested in either and that their priority is staying with their home school. So if they... Uh, if, no, if there's no. a sibling there. If there's a sibling. Yes. <laughs> so they would write on their application, I want half day, but if I have to be in full day to stay yes. with my sibling. Yes. And that will be clearly stated on the application. They, I just they, wanna... Well, the application's already out. Yeah, they. it was very clearly stated that... It was that very clearly stated. Did. And I think Dr. Gardner already had some phone calls about it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just want... That way you'll still... Get, accurate numbers as opposed to yes. not being able to tell who really wants full day. Or right. That. Thank you. So, anything else? Bob? First of all, I want to thank you for putting this on the agenda tonight. It was a busy night and I had asked for us to have this discussion before December, so I appreciate that, Madam Chair. So, Dr. Darty, I, I want to thank you for what is, for me was a really helpful memo. Um, it's it's well drafted, it's concise, and and I think it provides an excellent summary uh, of the the factors that you're considering in student assignment. I had I had two things I wanted to cover um, tonight. One is just a, a question regarding policy, and the other is a question regarding the guidance that we provide the superintendent as a committee. Um, I wanted to, in, in this discussion, just to achieve clarity around where we are in, in the current practice and, and have an opportunity for anyone on the committee who wants to uh, comment on how we're applying our policy or interpreting our policy so it's clear to the community. Right? And what, what prompts that on my part is, is that in, in the last few years, and we had a longer discussion about this, but somewhat I felt under duress last year because we were, we were very focused on specific deadlines and enrollments last year. But one thing that happened last year uh, that I, I don't think it, ha it had happened before is that 
the degree to which enrollment the request for full day eclipsed request for half day had become so extreme in favor of full day that we suddenly had a capacity issue with how if we one was a capacity issue like how many students can we can we fit in the classroom uh, full day and the second was if, if when we heard evidence that there's there's an educator preference for moving away from a model where both half and full day were in the same classroom, right? So we heard those two things in our last meeting at this point. And so as a result of those factors, as I understand it, last year for the first time, the superintendent moved to a, a, an allocation where half day students were not at all five sites, not at all five schools. So. There were some students in half day who were at their neighborhood school, and there were some students who were not. And that's the first time I believe that is that Dr. Darty is that the first time that's happened. Or we that haven't had half day in every building. Yeah. Uh, yes, I believe. Well, since I've since been you've here. been superintendent, yes. Yes. right? So, so you know, that's and that's been a long, long time. So it was the opposite initially. Initially, that was, was very half, different. Was was full day in right. every building, and you had to go to a different. More school. than multiple right. half day. Yeah. For, yeah. for that, so so we had a, a different set of circumstances right. in, in the farther in, in the past, going farther back, but so. What I've sensed last year was that there was some surprise in the community and the feedback we received that, you know, we were, and I think the superintendent faithfully followed the guidelines that we have in front of us here in the memo. When I look at what the way that enrollment was handled, the decision to allocate, and it is, I want to be clear, under our policy, it is the superintendent's decision where your child will attend kindergarten. What building uh, is in is not a school committee question, it's an administrative question. Um, and, but, but what the school committee does do is provide policy um, and then provide guidance as part of evaluation as you would with any employee. And so that, that's where our involvement begins and ends. So when I look at policy JC and I compare it to these um, guidelines, I just want to explain how I can reconcile them and how, where I still struggle. And where I'm going with this, just for the, my other colleagues on the committee, is just, I would ask that, look, if we agree with the priorities as a committee that Dr. Darty has listed here as his understanding from what I've described as breadcrumbs, you know, this is from a, a series of conversations at meetings uh, with the school committee, different compositions of the committee over different years that, that these priorities have, have um, been clarified. Um, but I don't know that they're written in any, in fact, I don't believe they're written in any of our policies. And so if this is going to become the guidance that we want to adopt for the going forward, that's fine. I just want to be clear as a committee about the result of that is that you you may be in a position where you, as a parent, as you are last year, and, and it looks like from these enrollments, I, I don't know that this would change, but I can't speak to that officially, where you would face a choice where you would say, well, I can pay the $4,450 for full day. And if there are full day programs at every school, there's a likely probability, you can't say 100%, but there's a high probability that it's possible that my child could be enrolled in full day in the local school. Right? It's not guaranteed, it never is, but there will be full day in my school. If you don't pay that money, or, or, or you don't believe that full day is right for your kid for other reasons, in any case, then there's a chance if, if your local school does not host half day, that you can't go to your local school. Although you may be um, assigned there for first grade the following year. Right. So these attendance areas in Policy JC, we've always talked about and thought about it in terms of grades 1 through 12. But the, you know, kindergarten, we're required to offer half day. Children are not required to attend kindergarten. Um, but I, I, perhaps there are exceptions to it, but as a general rule. Right? So there's, there's different enrollments in kindergarten than first grade, and I understand that. And there's, there's good reason, is my point, why Policy JC may not apply to kindergarten, or you may not think. But I think we should be explicit about either saying, Policy JC, it's at the back of the packet. Because yeah. because that provides two primary, so I, I just want to turn to the policy and then turn to the guidance. So the policy JC says that from the school committee to the superintendent, we have two primary considerations in assignment of students to a, a, a school. Capacity, and I think that's what I've heard most of in, in the superintendent's discussion tonight is, we have a capacity problem. We can't give every um, full and half day student uh, their local neighborhood school, given the current enrollments and the physical constraints we have on um, building size, number of classrooms, and number of teachers. Um, so capacity and transportation, but I perceive a conflict here, right? So if, when we look at transportation, we then have these two general guidelines, safe walking conditions and incorporate community patterns. Well, the past community pattern has been different from last year. In the past, the community pattern was 
people generally went to their local school for the most part with some exceptions. Um, now we're saying, well, it depends on enrollment whether kindergartners are going to go to your local school and it depends on whether you're half day or full day. And we don't know exactly which neighborhood school it's going to be because we're going to try to optimize that to, to get to be, as I understand it, consistent with our transportation guidelines, right? About so, where you put the half day programs has to do with the two mile. Yes, yes. So anything over two miles, uh, we would have to provide that busing. So that's why you can't, you can't say in advance it's going to be this school and that school because you have to follow those guidelines. Well, right? well, no, it's actually if we have available classrooms. So it's the classroom chasing. It's the classroom that available. So it's like capacity. capacity. I mean, last, capacity this, this year we hit Killam and Eaton each had an extra classroom mm -hmm. available that allowed us to do what we what right. we did. And that's the top priority. Well, Where it, do we the, have room? There's right. two priorities. Well, this the policy just says, it doesn't say that, Chuck. It just says primary considerations. It doesn't draw a distinction between so, capacity and transportation. Right. I just, to be clear, the attendance, the attendance area I mean, I do believe that they apply across the district, but the school capacity and transportation considerations is because you're, that's when we're redrawing the attendance areas. So, and I know, I believe Chuck was on the committee when we did redistricting, or were you not? Okay, so I it's think- 2006. Okay, I might have been the only committee member currently here who did redistricting, and so the key on this in terms of defining the attendance areas for those schools, um, it, around the school capacity and the transportation is that you're drawing those lines so that um, the students that can attend that are within the two mile because we don't fund the busing largely, right? So right. That's, that's why those two are together, right? So that's first establishing the district attendance areas for each school. Um, and then, I, so I, I, I think that one of the things, and I'm not, and I, we probably do need to revisit this policy, but one of the things that I, that I hear you saying, Nick, is that sort of, as we've gone through this, and I, I sort of some notes that we've, um, we have some memo, we have memos and practice, and we dropped sort of some pieces of what our priorities are as we look at, um, you know, initially just spot redistricting, like when a new child shows up in the district in the middle of the year, how does the superintendent address that? And then, really, the, the kindergarten issue, they aren't really, that isn't really incorporated officially into our policy. So I think this is something that we should, um, you know, we should look to um, probably cleaning up and revising it getting those breadcrumbs back in here at some point potentially this year um, but Ms. Robinson so to your to your point Nick uh, I think that the if you read the paragraph from time to time an overcrowded condition in an existing school the development of a new result or whatever you know right. and so on that I think is the capacity issue which overrides uh, it says it overrides, uh, over may require the establishment or change of the previously established school attendance areas, right? I mean, where, 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 where I get confused though, Chuck, about this to answer your question is that your child may go to half day in a different school, but yet remain in your local school as their attendance area for first grade. So there's nothing here that says it's yeah. grade specific. My only point is that a member of the public should be able to read this uh, attendance area policy, understand what it applies to, and, and have some, just, I mean, we just passed the calendar in the interest of giving parents long-term certainty about when their child will have school and when they won't. My only interest here is in providing as much certainty as w what our policy and guidance is to the superintendent, understanding that there's tremendous uncertainty in enrollments and, and, and there's no way that, that, that I would expect that to change. I'm just saying when I read this as someone reading a policy and then I read the guidance, which I think was really, really well summarized here, mm -hmm. um, it, it says we have a prioritized list in the memo. I mean, if we want to adopt this as our guidance and say for kindergarten it's, it's these set of five priorities in this order and for everything else it's JC I'm I'm satisfied with that and but I, I just want some clarity and it last June I mean, that's not new that's, that's right from the slide pretty much from June 4th mm -hmm. yes right I think um, I mean I don't know that we want to adopt that as the policy tonight okay. but um, you actually no. can't we got so you'd have to do right we have to do, <laughs> and also I think we want to make sure that we're, we are we do end up being really clear about sort of attendance areas and district lines and then how we're managing the, the kindergarten enrollment I think though um, 
you know, Mr. Bobbin noted sort of what the, um, you know, what the issue is with how that decision process is related to the half day and the full day and the, the choice that you make. Um, Oh, sorry, I haven't looked to the left at all. Ms. Sprowski. Thank you. Um, I actually agree with a lot that Mrs. Webb said, and I just want to articulate it. Um, I think this is an interesting and a productive discussion, but I think we're conflating attendance areas, which are pretty for all the people. I think we're conflating attendance areas, which are fairly static. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, so you so you know, if you're between right. these streets, these streets, you're in the attendance area for this school versus this school, and the there is a sentence in here that says generally students will attend the school in the attendance area in which they live. Off the top of my head, if your child has a special need that is better serviced, you will not be in your attendance area. Right. If you're in a swing district and we have oversized class you will not be in your local neighborhood school. Mm -hmm. Full day, half day kindergarten, you may not be in your local neighborhood school. Mm -hmm. And I'll give one more example. A couple of years ago, right before we set up the modulars, like right before, mm -hmm. at Barrows, there was inexplicably an enormous income kindergarten class. Inexplicably, Barrows always has three classrooms per, for, per grade for as long back as anyone can remember, and we needed four classrooms at Barrows. Had the modular not been built, a full classroom of kindergartners was going to be sent outside of their neighborhood school mm -hmm. for no reason at all other than that year there were a lot of babies in barrows. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those circumstances I just listed mm -hmm. would not impact this policy. This policy is how do we establish, so I think that's the point you were making Mrs. Webb that if we suddenly had a massive development of property somewhere and it necessitated redistricting. Um, Though that's when you look at this policy. Mm -hmm. I look at the stuff that I just described as separate from this policy. Mm -hmm. Attendance mm -hmm. areas are static. Mm -hmm. so the kind of stuff you're describing is much more individualistic. Mm -hmm. And I don't know quite how to incorporate it, but I'm not persuaded it's in this policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be an additional policy. Somewhere else, yeah. So, Mr. Robinson? So just a thought, maybe, and not for tonight, but maybe we, so when the, this, this is a, and then Sarah, I look at this as the global policy for, for, but the when, the, when, we, when these were written, we were probably a district that was mostly half day kindergarten, right? Mm -hmm. So that is correct. So yes. now we maybe need a policy for kindergarten, mm -hmm. and we put the superintendent's option and everything in there, mm -hmm. so it's laid out. So. When a kindergarten parent's going to look at policy, they're going to the kindergarten policy and not yeah. this global policy, right? Is that? Yeah, and I, I mean, whether we need to create more policy or not, I think is, I, I, I'm interested in the views of others on the committee. This discussion and this moment, frankly, gets most of the work done that I was hoping for, from this mm -hmm. agenda item. What I wanted was a written codification of what are the priorities in assigning your kindergartner after you make that request. And we have that it's in the memo. Mm -hmm. um, I don't hear anybody here disputing those or saying they should be different. They're, they're consistent with, mm -hmm. you know, what do we say, community patterns, right? This is consistent with how it's done before. What, what troubled me was that we got here piecemeal, mm -hmm. I feel. And I just want a level set for all the parents going forward that these are the criteria that we're agreeing to evaluate and, and support the superintendent on. If we want to change these, then we don't change their, they, we're not the people to come to if you don't like where you were assigned for kindergarten, to be clear. We never will be. But if, if as a matter of policy, we think a different approach is better in, in, in terms of weighing these options or weighing these factors, that's something that we owe it to the superintendent to be clear about and deliberate about as a committee. And I think this gives us that tool to be deliberate going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, my one strong reservation about this set of priorities, I see benefits that we talked about in June of having classrooms that are all half day or all full day. I see benefits to giving access to every student whose parents want them in full day, a full day spot. Absolutely see that. Gene, to your point, the one thing that really concerns me is this is, of the factors you named, this is the first year last year that we haven't had uh, kindergarten half day in your attendance area available. And it applies categorically to everybody who is not in the attendance area assigned for that half day program. That troubles me. I, I see the benefits, but I can't ignore the fact that it costs money to do full day. 
it costs a lot of money, right? So we saw the statistic, I remember in June, of about 90% of the schools that charge fee for full day are less than us. And we own that as a committee. That's, that's a number I remember, but it, it, was, it was a high number. We own that, and that wasn't, you know, we didn't aim to change that in our budgets or in our override request, et cetera. So that's something that, that I think this committee owns. It's not something the superintendent owns, it's something we own. But this set of priorities with the current enrollment patterns results in parents having to choose between not just what's right for their child, but thinking about whether they will have access to a neighborhood school that they paid tax dollars to fund, to put it bluntly. So I, I just, that is my concern about these set of priorities. I see the benefits. I have that concern. It's a strong concern. Um, so I'd be interested in what others think. Dr. Doxer, um, there's a lot of, um, it's unsettling not to know exactly where your child will go. I think part of what's so wonderful about a school system is our school district is no matter what school you go to in this town, your child's going to get a great education. Mm -hmm. And that's what our tax dollars pay for. Our tax dollars don't pay for a certain community school. They pay for the programs. And the reason the superintendent has the flexibility and the discretion is so that the best classes are going to be planned for every child. So if a half day program were planned in every school, there might be, we have a school with eight in a, a classroom, if that number is still the same, and a class with 16, a class with 18, you get smaller than eight, what, what's optimal for the kids' learning environment? Dr. already mentioned that, you know, getting too small isn't optimal either. So if it's the matter, and, and also was mentioned, a child care, a, a child, early childhood center allows you to balance that across and put, well, we don't have that. But I think that because that whole process educated our community about the early childhood center, that we shouldn't lose those lessons. I mean, the goal was to be able to balance it so everybody was going to the same place and classrooms and teachers were spread evenly to give the children our priority, the best program. Um, in terms of who the children are, are in class with, they're doing preschool activities so they're with kids from all around town. It's not a separation of them from their peers at that point. They haven't made that transition to their neighborhood school. It's just basically delaying it a year. And it might be inconvenient, but I thought the schools tried to bend over backwards to provide those programs um, to ease those drop-off challenges. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of our tax dollars, I think people are getting what they're paying for, which is a great education for their young children, a great way to start off and build a foundation. Um, and if it's not in the neighborhood school where they expect it to be, I acknowledge. You know, I chose my house because I went and visited different schools and fell in love with Killam, and I get it. Um, it would have been hard to compromise on that. But I also visited Birch Meadow, and it would not have been a compromise. Um, it would have been also great. So I think those tax dollars are paying for a good education and not a neighborhood school. Mm -hmm. All the way from preschool sometimes mm -hmm. to grade 12, and we just heard about the grade 12 mm -hmm. um, trajectory that I'm really proud of and thankful for. Ms. Borowski, so good news and bad news. I think you are articulating a serious problem. And the good news is there's a really easy solution to it, and the bad news is it's a really expensive solution. Yes. Yeah. The good uh, news is full day publicly funded kindergarten for all students solves all of this. Mm -hmm. So there is a solution to this problem. It costs a million dollars a year, and we all have been through this. That's an enormous amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, so until and unless we're there, and mm -hmm. until and unless we have a plan for that, um, I think we're going to always be stuck in this situation of how do you prioritize, how do you, in a situation where not every family is going to get what they want, mm -hmm. there's going to be some difficulty until we have that sort of perfect solution. The, your question is, so how do you prioritize? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's, it's 
which of those have the biggest educational impact. That's, mm -hmm. That would be my suggestion. If you're going to disenfranchise or, or make somebody feel um, that it's unequal, that it isn't fair, um, then, then the answer has to be, but the priority was what's best for student learning mm -hmm. and student outcomes. So that's how I would approach it. Mm -hmm. Dr. I'm wondering, actually, and maybe it's already being done, but we had a really kind of raucous spring in getting used to these changes around kindergarten, and I'm wondering if it might be beneficial to bring people together who have half day and full day kindergarten and get their glean their insights into what works and ha worked and how it worked and like I'm wondering if they developed relationships and worked out carpools and that kind of advice for those people that are worried about that transition in those different schools might be really helpful and and their insights will be really valuable and it will give ownership and build relationships going forward across our schools, which we know are really important because our parents are our best assets in terms, I mean, our teachers and our parents are really important in terms of how they volunteer and what they give to the schools also. Um, and so building those relationships and finding out from them what tools they develop to use when they needed to go to separate schools and that might just be helpful. Ms. Robinson, go ahead. So I think a lot of what happened last spring was that we all talked. It was a communication problem more than anything. I think that if we maybe step back and look at putting together a kindergarten policy, like, for example, I want to, I mean, now I'm getting back into the weeds of last spring, but I still want to, I still haven't, I found out at those meetings that integrated wasn't a good model but i never got a presentation of, remember we talked so i mean those are all things i'd want to talk about again before we and then have put put together a policy for kindergarten i think then then there's no there's no uh you know there's there's no uh so, uh the people understand that there's not going to ever be any mystery as to what it is if it's in a policy I think um, I think Dr. Wright has given some level of report on that, but that's something that I mean the uh, kindergarten teachers were certainly very vocal on. Um, you know, I, I I think where we are right right now today is that this you know in, in I'm hearing support generally for this. Um, yes. I don't see that we're going to change this today. It's um, it's it's well defined. It's explicit. It puts the pieces together in one place. Um, something you know to develop a separate policy so that we don't conflate the district attendance areas with you know how do you approach the providing the superintendent with the flexibility that he needs um, you know to make these assignments uh, or reassignments. I think that's something that we, we we might decide we want to do in policy at some point or potentially this year. Mr. Bob? Yeah, so, so just a couple points to follow up uh, for Dr. Doxer. I thought you made a really good point that I hadn't thought of before, which is that the practice from last year, if carried forward, and it appears from these numbers that it will be, of, of having some sites, and tell me if I'm speaking wrong, but if we, if we continue to see the imbalance that you've represented in your memo, would we end up with a certain number of half-day uh, sites and other sites that are only full day. Um, it's possible. Again, the the challenge is going it's to possible. be space. I'll take possible. Yeah, I, I, it's going to be space. So my my point is that <laughs> we we may have a similar arrangement to next year, and you're going to prioritize these considerations in making your decisions. Yeah, yes. Right. We're not going to have a system where we say every school is going to have half day, and then we're going to mm -hmm. we're going to change these priorities. These are our priorities, right. and right. and if we need to put some students in half day in some schools but not others, that is what we will do to make right. these priorities yes. apply. Right. That is what I want. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm very happy now. And that's what I communicated that the other night. That's right. what we, that's and, what and, 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 No, and, and, and so, so to Dr. Doctor's point, that approach has the benefit of expanding parental networks, which is what you were describing. Right. So there's an added benefit I hadn't thought of. And to, to Chuck's point, I actually thought we did hear feedback from educators in our June round uh, of discussion on this point. We had some written evidence. We had parents come and speak to Dr. Doctor's point as well. I thought we received 
coalition of the interested showed up and gave us mm -hmm. their thoughts and, and they went in different directions with their thoughts. So I think we I think we did get what I hope is a representative amount of evidence to, mm -hmm. to weigh and deliberate on. I think this policy is an outgrowth of that evidence. Well what I was I, I felt like we were in a situation last year where we, we the numbers were imbalanced to an extent they had never been before, between half and full. We had crossed some Rubicon, some threshold beyond which we couldn't turn back, and now suddenly parents were surprised to find out that they had enrolled their child in half day but were not given their local neighborhood school and had expected that. Now, Gene, to your point, they should never always expect that. But it was a categorical move. It wasn't and a spot how move. things are. Right? So, so I feel like this, for me, gives clarity. If we want to enter around a policy in the future or whatever, I, I, I'm, I'd participate. But if, this is, if what I've articulated is the approach that this district is going to take going forward, we can give parents this memo mm -hmm. and say, look, this is, right. this is how we're going to prioritize your child's enrollment. And mm -hmm. we cannot, to your point, guarantee, Dr. Darty, that you will have your neighborhood school in a half-day program, and it's going to cost this amount of money to be in a full-day program. And even then, you're not guaranteed to get your local neighborhood school. But all... But it's more likely than not that all neighborhood schools will have a full-day program and not necessarily a half-day program. If that's, that's where we are, that's where we are. Yeah. That's where we are. Then let's just yeah. be a complete policy. and say it yeah. and, and have people a know. Policy that. puts clarity to it rather than you know digging out a memo or, or someone else. if it's a different committee. Uh, you know, there's a policy that people can go to. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd favor some kind of follow-up action to, you know, if you want me to participate, I'll volunteer. But it just, I like this memo. People can find it, right, yeah. in, in this school committee packet. I'd like a, a something in policy JC or JC2, right, that, could that people that. Could, could reference yeah. this or have it in it. I would like that even more. Dr. So to that point, great segue. <laughs> <laughs> to that point, JC would be the place that you would put something similar to what's in the memo right. into the policy. So uh, there is no other policy that MASC would lend you have for kindergarten assignments. It would be under attendance areas. Mm -hmm. So um, it would be something that you would want to do in like May, June, July time yeah. frame to do a, a first and second reading, which okay. we can easily put together. Okay. I would, I would so move to, I don't know if we can. That, I think that would be a good that. thing to, yeah. to, to yeah. work on, and, and we can, Dr. Darty and I can work to put that on the calendar yeah. in the spring. Sorry, I, I'm just going to, one last point. Yeah. Um, Dr. Doxer, it's to your point, actually. One thing that I thought of as you were speaking that is the amount of effort the district put into to creating a uniform educational yeah, experience yes. across five elementary schools. And we are somewhat unique, mm -hmm. I think, in the Middlesex League in having five. That is, uh, right. yes, we are very We are, we yes. are a very diffuse district. We have five elementary schools. That's very unusual, and it's a big challenge to get the classroom experience to be consistently high quality as it is. And that's because of a lot of hard work by the administration and teachers to get us there. So I think that's a great mm -hmm. thing to add. I'm sorry to interrupt. Thank you. I just wanted one more thing. Okay. Um, just quickly that, um, and Mr. Boivin, you brought it up. Um, it's really clear that there was a lot of listening that went on last spring. And that listening changed the outcomes last spring. Things were adjusted. Um, and it went into the creation of that memo. And I think that I'm really grateful to our superintendent and our administrative team for being able to listen and move with five elementary schools and all these moving parts to provide this this really quali high quality education um, in a time of change because full day and half day kindergarten is really fluid right now so it's it's really cutting edge and there are no real roadmaps so um, I'm grateful for that work and that listening. Thank you. Before Dr. Dox reads us, I just want to um, make sure we know that um, on our calendar, town meeting is in November and our next school committee meeting is the 6th and you have a motion for us. Okay. To protect the bargaining position of the board, move to enter executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining, negotiation strategies with respect to non-represented personnel, and not to return to open session. Okay. And I need roll call, Ms. Browski? Yes. Dr. Doxer? Yes. Ms. Webb? Yes. Ms. Yes. Robinson? 
Mr. Bob. Yes. Excellent. Thank you.